what's the worst one you've seen? Jacob asked, lying next to me with binoculars in hand. The young man had spent most of the trip moaning about the drizzly weather of mid Wales, so it was good to hear him sound a little interested in the work. It's hard to say, I replied. You know those big beach umbrellas? Yeah. I saw one of those get blown into a kid's birthday party wines. The old man goes up to pull the cord to stop it from knocking a few tables over, and next thing he knows, it's wrapped around him and he can't get it off. So, his wife goes to help and then a brother and a cousin. I shrugged. Mimics don't normally get exposed to so many people. It would be like dropping a lion in an industrial meat packing factory. What made it so bad? He asked. And did it just eat a lot of people? Yeah, kind of, I said. Six adults and three children. Thing is, that mimic would have been lucky to get one meal a year, naturally so. While uh, it ruptured. The whole thing just burst and it injured itself. By the time we got there, we found it wounded in the pool, screaming like a banshee. While it fought against all that food, it refused to let go. The kids were already halfway to soup, but some of the adults were still alive and screaming. It was like watching slow-cooked ribs fall apart under the fork. I see why that's bad, he said, momentarily falling silent, as he pictured it for himself. Our umbrella's common. Anything that moves in the wind is a candidate because some mimics use the weather to change up their hunting grounds, I said. Of course, it ain't ever that simple. All we can do really is look at reports of missing people and follow up. They're patient, that's for sure. Any as big as this fella, he said, gesturing to the chapel on the plains below. I've heard rumors, I replied, from some of the old guard. Back when the world was bigger and there were less people to fill it, I guess it was easier for these things to hide back then. We have a few reports from old sailors about things that may have been mimics. Shipwrecks that glittered with gold and the promise of loot. No one can say for sure. The information age has hit these things hard, and of course, we've hit them harder. But no, personally, I haven't seen anything like this before. Freaking weird, he muttered, eyes straining to pick out the faint hint of motion that drove the chapel forward. Move so slow you barely see it. About that, I said. Let's get in for a closer look. I want to know more about how this thing locomotes. The ground was porous, like someone had gone over it with a thousand knitting needles, punching holes straight into the ground. Curious, I took a piece of thin wire filament out of my toolbox and unspooled it into one of the openings. When I pulled it back out, it measured six feet long. Well, that explains the locomotion, I said. It reminds me of a starfish. My apprentice was stood behind me. I could feel him anxiously glaring at the chapel. He had been nervous the whole time that we were walking towards it. It stopped, he whispered. It's, it's looking right at us. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little creeped out by the way the building slowly rotated to face us. Maybe it was just the way the door and the windows lined up, but I couldn't help but see its facade as a face. Not an evil one either, just a dumb one, like the kind of face that sucks a mollusk out of its shell deep in the ocean. A mindless piece of evolution driven by hunger and nothing else. Minds like that don't have much malice. Resisting them or pleading with them is like begging the wind to change direction. Slowly, the church began to advance. That isn't right, I grumbled, standing upright as I urgently began to put my things away. What's it doing? He asked. What do you think? I snapped. It's hunting us. You said they were ambush predators, he cried. You said they would never actively hunt a person. That I'd have to be an idiot to get caught once I knew what it was. Shut up and get me the duffel bag with the blue tag, I told him. This isn't the time to argue. The boy walked backwards, refusing to take his eyes off the building. For Pete's sake, Jacob, I cried. It doesn't go over half a mile an hour. Turn around and look properly. 
You could tell that he wasn't happy, but he did as I said. A few moments later, he returned with the bag and I rifled through it to get a hold of what I wanted. A hand grenade. Will that kill it? He asked. Mimics are usually soft on the inside, I said. But honestly, I don't know. I never killed a building before. I pulled the pen, let the spoon flick loose, and tossed the grenade straight through the open door of the chapel. Five seconds, I counted them out, but nothing happened. Nothing changed. I had expected a muted thump, or perhaps something even worse. Something bad. But there was no noise at all and I found that fairly unnerving. The only thing was that the chapel finally stopped advancing. Is it hurt? If the grenade went off, it has to be hurt, I said. But then again, does it look hurt? The building rotated 90 degrees and began to grind slowly away from us. Behind me, Jacob began to whoop and cheer with joy. Take that, he cried. But I didn't feel so confident. It was unlikely we would lose the chapel and have to find it all over again. The Desert of Wales describes an enormous expanse of arid stony land, unsuitable for anything except grazing. It wasn't a literal desert, and if anything, it never stopped raining. There just wasn't much around to see or do outside of a few lonely buildings and abandoned quarries. Most plant life consisted of hardy lichens and fuzzy moss, along with dense thickets of bristling grass. It was hilly for sure, but I didn't think we had to worry about a building sneaking up on us, so I didn't bother giving chase once the chapel moved away. Instead, I sent us walking north to a nearby campsite where a few hikers had first reported it eating all of their friends. Jacob was less inquisitive now. He hadn't liked seeing the chapel up close and, truth be told, neither did I. Most mimics I had encountered were small. Estimates from other field agents like myself at them as typically no larger than 12 kilograms, subsisting on rats and mice and other vermin, and they might nab a child here and there. And sometimes, we would get a real doozy like a carnivorous closet in some ancient B&B. But the tabletop game image of mimics were desperately overblown, and I had never personally laid eyes on anything like that chapel, slowly grinding its way towards us. Mimics weren't animals, and they weren't plants either. To see one move around like that, I didn't like it. The campsite, once we had reached it, sure as heck it didn't help. When I had heard about the hikers, I figured they were tricked into going inside the building. But the broken tents and pulped remains told us otherwise. At least two people had been crushed during the night. I could see that clearly from the collection of canvas and pureed flesh that lay on the outskirts of the site. They were the first victims I had been told. Just like the tracks I had seen before, their deaths had been achieved with what looked like thousands of knitting needles punching through rock and soil. And in this case, bone and muscle and fat and skin. They must have been sleeping, I decided, when the chapel simply rolled over them with a glacial slowness. As for the others, that wasn't so simple. Tents were slashed and pulled apart, bones still pink and wet, and they scattered around the fire. This looked more like the work of a pack of dogs than a mimic who usually left a little behind except for bleached bones so clean. You could mistake them for some kind of museum display. They must have tried to help each other. I said as I counted out the fifth ribcage. Like that story I told you about, that's the only way I've seen mimics rack up this kind of body count. They trap one guy and his friends come to help and it just, it just escalates. Most of them inject digestive enzymes like an arachnid. Sometimes that includes a few basic poisons that act on the nervous system. That could account for it, maybe. Jacob didn't respond, at least not to my question. I stayed crouched where I was for a few more minutes, staring at the carnage before he spoke up. It crushed their skulls. What? Look, he replied, holding up a pile of bone chips in his cupped hands. Slowly, he let them all fall through the cracks in his fingers like sand, until a few larger pieces remained. 
He took one and passed it over, and I instantly recognized the bridge of a nose. They're all here. It crutched them, practically ground them into powder, all in one place as well. It's almost ritualistic. No, it's not, I replied. Mimics don't do that. They don't think and they sure as heck don't do rituals. So, how do they know what to imitate? Come on, I snapped. Let's get back to the car. You didn't answer my question, he said. And I could tell that he had been working up the courage to challenge me on this for the last hour of the hike. What question? How do mimics know what to imitate? He asked. Well, they don't reproduce, if that's what you mean. What do you mean they don't reproduce? They don't screw. They don't lay eggs. They don't even grow or gain weight after feeding. They're not animals, so they don't reproduce. And on top of that, we have records of things that weren't mimics becoming mimics, I replied. A car for one. There was a closet in the London Natural History Museum that was most definitely not a mimic on the 9th of July, 1991, but which still proceeded to eat three janitors by the 13th of August that same year. There was a brief moment of silence before Jacob's voice suddenly rang out across the windswept plain. What? he cried. Are you telling me these things just, just appear? Don't know, I shrugged. Not my job to know. That's a different department. But, but yeah. Things every day, things can apparently just turn into mimics. So like what? My backpack could become a mimic at any time. Maybe, I replied. What you should be worried about is so can your dog and so can you. It's rare, but it can happen. Sometimes they don't even know. It's just boom and it just happens. You wake up and your wife isn't there and you don't know why. But you suddenly have a funny looking scar on your chest and your tummy won't stop rumbling. I think we have three in containment at the moment. One of them swears that someone did it to him. Is he lying, deluded? Who knows? This time Jacob didn't respond. He walked the rest of the trail in silence while he wrestled with the implication of what he had just learned. There is at any time, probably less than 50 mimics in existence, but once you realize that there's nothing stopping one from popping up in your cereal box, or taking over your car or your bed, yeah, it can be a little tough to sleep at night. Maybe I shouldn't have dropped it on him like that, but my own nerves were playing up something awful on that stony trail and I just wanted space and quiet. Already the sun was starting to dip and the sky was full of graying clouds. We had enjoyed some fairly decent weather so far, but now it looked like our luck was running out and for some reason, I didn't much fancy seeing that dang church coming at us while heading behind the night and a slate of grey drizzle. Instead, I focused on settling down for the night in that kitschy little bed and breakfast that we had scouted on our way up. Sure, we had a long drive ahead of us, but I was thankful that the walking part of the day was over. Oh, how wrong I was. At first, I thought we had reached the wrong patch of gravel because, as I crested the hill, I quickly noticed that there was no sign of my car's roof. But no, I realized the trail was recognizable. That tree in the distance was the same one I had made a note of when we had parked up. Had the car been stolen, I wondered incredulously. Surely not in a place so remote. As my legs carried me further and the rest of the lot came into view, I soon realized the answer was somehow even stranger. My car had been crushed flat. Pulverized might be the better word. It looked more like a stand in the ground than a four-ton pickup truck. A better account would be to say that it had been picked apart by a thousand tiny ice picks, until its footprint was nearly as big as an 18-wheeler. It was so bizarre that Jacob looked down at it for a few moments before asking, Where's the truck? That clever thing, I muttered, not quite sure of how to answer not that I needed to. Jacob put two and two together from just looking at it for long enough. No, 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 he said. You told me they aren't smart. Ambush predators, he cried. Freaking ambush predators. 
That's what you told me. Get it together, I snapped. Do you think every job was a walk in the park? I hope the stern treatment would whip some sense into the boy, but it didn't work. Instead of calming down, Jacob began to cry and swear and shout all sorts of things at me and the agency before falling over himself and landing on his butt, tears brimming in his red-rimmed eyes. For a second there, I wanted to slap him, but that was when I realized he had stopped all noise and taken to staring right past me. I turned and saw the chapel about 50 feet behind us, and my skin crawled with disgust to see it so close. Its motion was so silent as to be a whisper and my brain rebelled at the idea that this thing was looming larger and larger. But there was a no denying the sight whether it made any sense or not. I grabbed Jacob by the collar and hauled him to his feet even as he sobbed. Thankfully, he reflexively latched onto the bags I stuffed into his arms while I pulled out a map and took a look for the nearest sign of a civilization. It was odd, but even with that chapel going no faster than a yard every few 30 seconds, I could feel it like an itching on the back of my neck. Something about a ticking clock can make even the simplest of tasks difficult, and I had to struggle to keep my concentration as I figured out our position and drew a straight line to a nearby farmhouse. Come on, I said, and tugging at Jacob's arm so he would turn from the chapel and start to follow. It's Wales and not Siberia. We can make it out of here, walk the whole way to the nearest town if we have to. Jacob had finally calmed, cast a glance over his shoulder and shuddered. I already knew what he was thinking, even if he never said it. No one wanted to walk that far with that thing coming up on our tail. Where does it go? The sun was down and we had no choice but to set up camp in an open field. Part of me wanted to hide, to march to the nearest bit of woodland off in the distance, and find a hole in the ground to stay out of sight. But I knew dang well that was a bad idea. Our best hope was to keep an eye on this thing, and at its current rate of travel, and the two mile gap that we had put between us and it. I figured we had about four hours before we needed to get going again. And I was going to make sure that we could keep our eyes on it for every second of that time. Or at least one of us would. We both needed to sleep, Jacob especially. So for now, having settled down by a small fire with very little cover, I told the boy to catch some shut-eye while I watched. Where does it go? He repeated, and I tore my eyes away from the horizon to look back at him. They don't reproduce, they don't grow, but you can't destroy matter, right? So, all the stuff they eat, where does it go? Like that umbrella you told me about. What was it going to do with all those people? I don't know, I shrugged. If it hadn't pushed itself and gotten greedy, it would have probably just dissolved its first catch and at some point later, and crapped out a caustic white substance that weighs a fraction of the original meal. That's all that would have remained. But as for the rest of it, we don't know, I said. Come on, you have to try to at least get some sleep. It's freaking freezing, he whined, pulling his coat closer around his chest and neck. I'd give anything for a tent. I almost told him that it hadn't done the hikers much good, but I stopped myself. It would have only freaked him out and besides, I watched him take my advice and close his eyes. When I looked back, the chapel had disappeared. For a second, it made the breath catch in my throat, but the shock didn't stick around for long. I had known for a while now that the chapel wasn't a simple thing. It had cut ahead of us all the way to the car and it had trashed it. That was the kind of tricky behavior you wouldn't even expect from an apex predator, like a bear or a mountain lion. I didn't much like it, but I started to wonder if this thing was going to get the better of us. Knowing what I did about mimics and how they fed, the thought of this thing catching us didn't make me feel like relaxing one little bit. I found myself hoping Jacob made it through all this. He had asked a pretty astute question back there. Where does it go? I hadn't lied either, we didn't know. But that didn't mean we couldn't guess until boy. And the guys at the agency had guessed galore. The longest running theory was that we just didn't see mimics reproduce. But like a bad excuse, 
that was starting to fray the longer that we held on to it. 90 years and counting and not one example of a mimic being born in lab conditions. Of us even finding the slightest evidence of that behavior out in the wild. A nest, some eggs, anything. And why the heck didn't they weigh more after feeding? The more we documented them and the more we learned, the more elaborate these scientists had to become in explaining it all. The second theory, the newest and what was soon becoming the most popular, was some kind of infection or fungus or something. We've dissected enough of these things to learn a thing or two. Heck, the boss back at HQ had a vivisected mimic pencil sharpener preserved in amber as a desk ornament. It's pretty neat, actually. And what these dissections show is that mimics keep a lot of the original object. They splice nervous systems and strange, discombobulated muscular fibers onto hard, inanimate structures, and somehow it just works. As to why they seem to pick the right objects at the right time, maybe they don't. Maybe this stuff's everywhere and it just needs the right conditions to flourish. Maybe your computer mouse is trying to turn into a deadly predator, but it just can't because every time you use it, it agitates all those little microbial construction workers and it all comes falling apart. But the smarter amongst you will realize this still doesn't answer Jacob's question. It might be the how, but it doesn't really do the why. I mean, after all, where does it go? They don't have stomachs, well not really. They're like arachnids. They suck this stuff up and it just goes. Somewhere, we think. There is one more theory. People don't talk about it. Not even in the agency. But I think push come to shove. Just about any field agent worth his salt would admit to it being the most likely explanation. The scientist who came up with it disowned his own theory just a few days after first posting it to the message boards, but I always suspected it wasn't because he thought it was NAF. He just didn't like it being tied to his name. Can't say I blame him either. Anyway, he posited that mimics aren't separate organisms at all, that they're a projection of something. The reason why they pick specific objects is because there is an intelligence behind them, behind all of them as a matter of fact. They aren't independent organisms. They're more like proboscises attached to a single source. That's why we can't find where the digested food goes, he says. It's getting sucked out of the physical world in front of us and redirected somewhere else. The thought of every mimic ever caught being nothing more than a tentacle, belonging to some unseen force. It fit a lot of facts, but it sure as crap it didn't make that scientist any friends. The implication that this thing is intelligent, that it has some kind of memory and might remember us agents, what we do, well, we don't talk about it much. No one likes to think these things might be able to hold a grudge. When I awoke, it was to the sound of Jacob screaming and for a few brief seconds, I expected to see red splashed across the floor. It just made sense to me that that kind of gut-wrenching squeal would come with a great big helping of red and broken bones. Instead, when I opened my eyes and scanned the horizon, I was greeted with an even bigger shock. The chapel was about 30 feet away. I threw myself onto my feet and suppressed the feeling of revulsion that swept over me, letting that thing get so close. God, it felt like I had woken up to a big fat hairy tarantula crawling right towards my mouth. All I had to survive were my wits and my senses, and I had practically thrown both away by letting myself fall asleep without first waking Jacob up to stay on watch. Still, no use in giving in to hysteria, I decided. I stood where I was and caught my breath and calmed down even as the chapel continued to grind towards us. Up close, that thing was almost grotesque. I don't know how to put it except that it was messy. The thatch roof was freighted and peeling, and every whitewashed brick looked somehow misplaced. The building itself was easily 400 years old, and must have predated silly ideas like blueprints and architecture. It was surely cobbled together piecemeal by rural villagers centuries ago, until some other force had animated it. Its many arching windows reminded me of the clustered black eyes of a spider, lacking any sign of symmetry and intelligent thought. It was stupid, but it really did make me think of something pulled out of the ocean trenches, 
like a venomous little anemone. Even as I looked, up close at last, I could see the slightest hint of pulsating webbing behind the dusty stained glass. Veins, perhaps, used to pump blood around this impossible creature. Behind me, Jacob was hyperventilating, but at least his crying had stopped. Without me telling him, he started to reach down and grab his bags off the floor, which was good. As much of a disaster as this trip was turning out to be, at least he had bounced back after his first freak out. Throw me that bag, I said, pointing to the duffel that he held in his hand. He did and I reached out to take out yet another grenade. This time, the chapel did not stop. I considered throwing the explosive anyway, trying to hurl it straight through one of the windows now that the door was shut. But our supplies weren't infinite, and it's not like it made a difference last time. I don't understand, Jacob cried. It stopped last time. It was scared. What's changed? I don't think it was ever scared, I said, snatching my things up from the floor as the chapel came closer with every second. We might be able to get ahead of it now, but it's a long hike to the nearest farmhouse. Come on, I added sternly. If we're quick, we'll get there before nightfall. Jacob, I said, nudging him with my elbow and gesturing to the nearby cliff. The stepped rocks made for a surface that was close to vertical, but which could easily be clambered over one by one by a person without any gear. What do you think? He glanced over at the chapel that trailed relentlessly behind us. It did not stop for three hours and neither had we. And while we could not be sure of exact measurements, I was certain that slowly, maybe at no more than an inch per hour, the distance was closing. I feel like I need a break, even if it's just for a few minutes to clear my head. If it forces that thing to reroute and buy us time to catch our breath, it's worth it, he replied. I agree, I said, stepping off the trail and heading towards the cliff. Both Jacob and the chapel followed. Many other time in my life, I would have looked at a series of five-foot climbs as nothing to worry about. Scaling fences and gates is a part of the job, and while I'm hardly an athlete, I'm not out of shape either. But something about stopping to gauge the distance, and then awkwardly pushing myself up one elbow at a time, slowing down felt risky and coming to a complete stop to climb a vertical distance, it felt outright crazy. I just had to hope that it would all pay off in the end. Jacob caught up with me quick enough on the first little step. Without taking even so much as a breath, we both grabbed a hold of the next ledge and began to haul ourselves up. By that point, I was sweating and very clearly out of breath, and Jacob wasn't faring much better but we had already climbed a good distance and couldn't resist the urge to look back and see how the chapel would handle our diversion. I wish I hadn't. The chapel didn't even slow. It scaled the first step as easily as it moved across to open terrain. How it did it, I can't be sure. It lumbered the front of itself up at a 45 degree angle and then slowly went all the way vertical. Unlike us, it did not stop at each ledge. The flat surface was too small to factor in for something that size, and unlike us, it didn't seem to find fighting gravity remotely difficult. For a moment there, I caught sight of its underneath and glimpsed a crawling mass of spidery legs that writhed over each other in an impossible swirl of glistening black. It repulsed me, like watching a starfish's thousand little suckers grope and fumble for purchase on a glass tank. Unlike Jacob, who had responded instantly to the chapel, I faltered as the thought of falling into that hive of clicking shapes paralyzed me with disgust. It didn't last long, but every foot of distance mattered. Our plan had backfired badly. The chapel had no issue with vertical surfaces, whereas we did. We had stumbled into one of the few scenarios where, if we weren't quick, that thing would quickly run us down. Get your butt going, Jacob cried, and I snapped out of my mortal panic and rushed over to the next ledge. Without giving it too much thought, I threw my backpack away along with any other supplies that I carried, and I dragged myself up and over the stony outcrop. 
I was barely on my feet when I heard the sound of my belongings being crushed. I only had one last ledge to go, and already Jacob was at the top of it all, reaching down to help. Fighting the urge to look back one more time, I ran and jumped and went to grab his forearm. My hand clasped firmly around his wrist, and together we began to haul me up while my feet scrabbled for purchase on the stone. Along the way, my toes slid into a crevice, and while it helped me push a little further, it was uneven and my foot slid too far down into the wedge. To my horror, when I tried to tug it free, it wouldn't come. I'm stuck, I cried, surprised to hear myself sound so afraid. Jacob knew what to do. Both hands wrapped around my arm. He pulled with all his strength and I gave it everything I had. We both understood the situation implicitly. It was better to tear my foot off than let it slow us down by even a single second. It came free in the end but not without injury. As I rolled over the final ledge and tried to crawl back up out of my feet. I saw that I had lost a shoe and most of the skin along my ankle. Ah crap, I hissed, tentatively reaching out to touch it. It needed dressing, it needed wrapping, it needed disinfecting. Do we have ice? I wondered, before suddenly realizing that I was in shock and thinking stupid things. Thankfully, Jacob put one arm under my shoulder and was already hobbling me along before the chapel crawled over the final outcrop, righting itself with a thunderous crash. After a few steps, I found that my foot could bear a little weight, and so I began to hop away on my own. I had to ignore the terrified expression on Jacob's face when he looked back on me in the chapel from up ahead. He didn't even have to say it. I knew it as well as he did. The chapel had closed over half the distance. I'm getting too old for this, I said as I limped along, breath ragged as I fought to keep pace with Jacob. You're not even 40, he grumbled. Yeah, but every mess I've made so far has been made by me, I hissed. The cliff, falling asleep on watch. You said the others weren't like this. They're not, I said. Not even close. If, if you get out of here alive... I stopped myself from saying it, but the damage was done. The silence between us hung heavy for long enough to let me know Jacob had absorbed that one little word and all its hidden meanings. Look, I said, you don't need to worry about the job when you get out. There ain't nothing out there that'll bother you after this. You'll still need supervision, but you can rest assured that you're personally up for the task. So you'll give me a good reference. I guess, I said. Best of the best. I wanted to broach the topic of how Jacob would contact the agency on his own, what passcodes to use, what names to ask for, but I could see that he was still stressed, so I didn't push it. As it was, Jacob kept drifting ahead of me. Sure, I was putting in a good effort, but at best, I was only delaying the inevitable. Sooner or later, I would be caught and it would be best if the guy knew how to make arrangements all on his own. Do you still have that grenade? Jacob asked. Surprisingly, I did. I haven't returned it to my pocket and not my bag. Probably not the smartest thing to do, I figured. But then again, I might just prefer having a nasty accident instead of falling under that monster's tread. Yeah, I said. But it ain't gonna work, you know that, don't you? Whatever's in those doors, we can't touch it. I'm not thinking about the doors. Jacob gestured to another rocky hill in the distance. Another cliff, he said. This one, we would have to go down. I know that thing went up nice and easy, but I mean, it must be unstable going down one, right? What are you thinking? I'm thinking that thing is vulnerable when it's going down rock at a nearly 90 degree angle. We just need something to pry it loose. And going down a set of stepped cliffs was no easy feat with my bad ankle. But my urgency was such that I didn't mind basically falling these several feet down each one and landing on my hands and knees. It hurt like crazy. And on the second one, I knocked my head so hard I wanted to roll over and be sick. But it was better than the alternative. And even as I fumbled to reach the third... 
The chapel crest of the highest ledge and its shadow fell across me. You ready for this? Jacob asked. He was stood up, a grenade in hand, having waited anxiously for me to catch up two ledges down. You have five seconds, right? Yeah, I'm ready, I said, like I was somehow impressive. My part of the plan involved crawling as hard and as fast as I could down each rocky step. It was Jacob who had to wait until the chapel was as close as possible before plopping the live explosive on the shelf above and legging it just like me, hopefully avoiding any injury. Truth be told, calling it a plan might have been a little generous, but you have to understand, we hadn't been able to stop or even think for more than a few seconds at a time. The chapel came onwards, and as soon as I heard the flick of the pen, I began to move, lowering myself feet first while I anxiously counted to five in my head. Soon enough, Jacob followed after me and, to my amazement, grabbed my collar with one hand and hauled me alongside with him. It was an incredible feat of strength, even if I wound up breaking three ribs and a fair few fingers, as we both basically underwent a controlled fall. I can't say how far we got, or whether we were protected by the rocks or distance or what. But after what felt like a painful eternity, there was a muffled thump, and we both looked up to see the chapel leaning forward at a strange angle. Oh, crap. I think it was me who had said it. From the looks of it, the planet worked, and the enormous building had lost whatever grip it had on the stone, and was now beginning a headfirst plunge down the jagged rock face but we had neglected to consider that we were right in the thing's path. I considered tucking myself into the rocky outcropping and hoping that the building would roll right over me without harm, but even just a fleeting glimpse of its blackened limbs flying around in a desperate hope for purchase made me think otherwise. I could easily imagine those needle-sharp proboscises snagging my skin and dragging me down with it. Jacob, however, came through, he never stopped pulling me by the collar, and in the end, he threw me sideways. I say throw, but it was more like a tumble off to the side. But I don't think you can appreciate how hard it must have been for him to do it. He saved my life in that moment, getting me out of the way so that the chapel went tumbling past, leaving us both unharmed. By the time the dust had cleared, we were both left bleeding and bruised halfway down the rocky steps. Looking at the chapel as it lay on its back squirming like a horseshoe crab stuck in the sun. It had millions of limbs buried under that floorboard, mouths as wide as needles, some as thick as a thumb. Where they came from or how they were even organized I couldn't tell. I didn't even like looking at them. They made my skin crawl. Still, I began to laugh as we stared at it trying to rock itself back upright smashing its roof and walls to bits. If it kept at it, it would soon end itself without any help from us. Jacob started to cheer, and this time, I decided to join in. We made our way down the cliff, and by the time we had reached the bottom, the chapel had stopped rocking and some of its legs had started to wither. I had never seen anything like it, but I couldn't stop myself from thinking that the mimic had decided to abandon the chapel entirely. I watched as it slowly withdrew its legs back inside the floorboards and out of sight, and I had the sense that we were watching this thing accept its final defeat. Freaking heck, Jacob cried, stepping forward as he strained to pick out the strange sounds coming from behind the glass. I think it's dying. That or going back to where it came from, I said, soon expecting a flurry of questions. Jacob was definitely curious, and this time... I would have no problem sharing all my thoughts with him. Only the questions never came. When I finally made eye contact with Jacob, he was looking paler than ever with eyes as wide as marbles. By the time that I saw the pulsating web of flesh that crept around the back of his head, slowly flowing around his ears like melting silly putty, it was too late. There was a sound like a rubber band snapping, and he was snatched backwards hurtling through the open door of the chapel like a sideways bungee jumper. He had been grabbed from over a hundred feet away. Whatever had happened, it was the mimic's final act. As the door slammed shut, it folded the last of its legs up into its insides 
and all of movement ceased. It was, and of this I'm incredibly sure, an act of spite. One that not only shocked me with fear, but left me feeling like my chest was going to crumble in on itself. I hadn't liked Jacob much at the start, but I would have been dead a long ago without him, and he had shown himself to have great potential. I had already begun planning how I would help him rapidly rise through the ranks of the agency. With any luck, he would have a career that lasted decades and took him right to the top. All of that was gone in less than a second. Despite knowing him for less than a week, I'm not ashamed to say I cried. The chapel was brick and mortar by the time that I returned with help. We traced it to some abandoned village years ago, and the researchers would go on to spend months poring over its tracks and hunting habits. Most of the evidence came from my first-hand account, and so I was taken out of field duty for well over a year, while being asked these same questions over and over again by slightly different people. It's weird to say, but I was celebrated. Jacob was awarded some posthumous medal and his parents fed the usual BS story about some kind of gas leak. I made sure they rigged the story so it looked like he had died doing something heroic, shutting down some valve before it blew up a few residential houses. But still, it didn't sit right with me that the true nature of what he did would never be known. Maybe that's why I'm posting this, I'm not sure. Since the chapel, I've been trying to get the agency to formalize the idea that these things can be intelligent. From there, I hope I might even be able to get them to acknowledge that there's even more to it than that. A lot of fuss was made over the mimicked withdrawing, but it was treated as a kind of spontaneous death. I'm not convinced. It was like it went slithering back to where it came from, and what worries me is that I think it took Jacob with it, possibly even alive. I only tried once to go back into the field. My partner, an experienced guy like myself, made sure that it was only a little job. Apparently, some grad students were complaining about missing specimens in their secure pathology labs. We quickly traced it to one of the tunnels in the rat's habitat. The kind of thing no traditional scientist would ever even consider looking at. But we knew. One glimpse at it in the powdery white discharge all around it. And let us know. A simple job. Easy too. But it was the note that I found, lying down in the matted sawdust and crap that stayed with me. The handwriting was desperate, but I recognized it as Jacob's nonetheless. It's not eating our flesh, it read, but it still hurts so bad. Today's episode is sponsored by Fume. You ever tried to break a bad habit and felt like you just can't gain any progress? Yeah, I've been there too, but here's a breath of fresh air. Fume. It's not about giving up, it's about switching up. Fume takes your habit and simply makes it better, healthier, and a whole lot more enjoyable. The Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, fume uses a flavored air. Instead of electronics, fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, fume uses delicious flavors. Your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your habit. The feel of it is great. It's extremely fun to fidget with and helps me relax and chill out after a busy day while also providing a healthier alternative to a bad habit. Start the year off right with The Good Habit by going to tryfume.com slash mrcreeps and getting the journey pack today. The Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use my code mrcreeps to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Start the good habit at tryfume.com slash mrcreeps to save 10% off of the journey pack today. Our family started where other families typically do not, inside a laboratory. I did not have a name, 
I did not have an age. I did not have hobbies. I awoke as a shell, as a valuable member of the Nestor family. I don't remember feeling anything except the ice-cold grays of tiles under my bare toes. It was strange waking up inside a body that I knew was mine and yet it also wasn't. My throat was still raw from her screams and my chest had ached. My stomach had trying to projectile into my throat. I sensed all of her panic, all of her pain, her fear. It burned inside me, but I was an empty shell incapable of feeling such emotion. I was not afraid like her, I did not panic. I was ready to follow my orders. At seven hours old, I was activated exactly three minutes before walking out under blinding light, and I still found it hard to balance myself with her lack of strength. She must have put up a fight for her body to be as weak as it was. Her memories were fading, spiraling down in a growing abyss in my mind, but I remembered splinters of her ending. I remembered the metal rod being forced inside her skull and the electroshocks rattling through her. The pain was still very much real inside me. It was raw and prickling, suppressed to the back of my mind. But I could not feel it. I could not feel her yearning for someone that she had lost, someone that she desperately had wanted back. Other me had a goal to find someone. That was all that I knew. Unlike others, she was not dragged from her bed or kidnapped on her way home from school. No, other me gave herself up. Step forward, Nestor family. The woman's voice was gravelly through the intercom, and I found my body automatically following commands. I was not the only one. There were others next to me. Brother, brother, and sister. And I was also sister. Like me, they were freshly emptied bodies fashioned into perfection. We did not have names yet. Names were given out on dispatch. I had woken up as sister. The electroshocks which had racked my body and brain, hollowing my other self out and turning her into me, said that I was sister. There were no other names. If there were, I was to be disposed of immediately. If even a single splinter of a name had appeared on my lips, or I began to unravel, I was to be destroyed like other failures. They did exist. I wasn't plastic or metal. I still had a human mind. I still had my senses and in those first initial hours of my new life, I heard screams down the hallway from my room. Not all potentials could be subjugated and processed. The ones who fought against programming were swiftly taken care of. Luckily, that did not happen. I was a part of the Nestor family. I had a purpose. My name was Sister, 18 years old, eldest of the Nestor children. Book smart but lacking in common sense. Stubborn, kind-hearted. I enjoyed watching television and getting to know my neighbors. Can you confirm your names, please? A bright light hit my face. I did not blink. I didn't need to. Unlike my other self who hated how intense the light was, it did not faze me. Sister, I said, staring forwards. The others followed suit. Brother. The two guys standing on either side of me spoke in sync when the light had hit them. To my left, the young woman standing shoulder to shoulder with me had scorched hands and lacerations on her wrist. My sister's lip trembled slightly, curving into silent screams pulled from her lungs. Her old self was still lingering. She was fresh, not even an hour old. Sister. Her voice was cracked and wrong, like it was being forced from her lips. If I had thoughts on my own, I might have suspected that she was awake, but I wasn't allowed to think or speculate. Once we had given our names and confirmed our model numbers, the four of us were tested. Having already been equipped with the necessary abilities to carry out my orders, 
I was quick on my feet when told to turn to the left and to the right. When I was shot at, my body reacted automatically, disarming the guard standing next to me and hitting the cardboard target, risking a sharp glance to my left. I allowed myself to look at my siblings properly, but there was nothing of them to drink in. I was looking at empty and unblinking eyes, focused on lumen figures, testing our reaction times. If there ever had been something, it had been away hours before inside the room with the bleeping machines. We had an audience along with the people in black testing our activation code. The word slipped inside my mind, easily slicing its way through my thoughts. Once said, my body was theirs, my thoughts puppeteered. Standing in the middle was the only silhouette that I had recognized. I knew the man from her memories. I knew the cruel curve of his lips went that he bent over her and forced the metal rod in further, reveling in her choked scream. The crunch of the end, splitting her skull apart and sending her body writhing against Velcro. The man was more shadow than human, his identity hidden in overexposed light. I did see what was pinched between his thumb and finger. It was a small device, a coil or a spring. He didn't explain what it was, but he didn't need to. I already knew what it was. It was the device buried inside of her heads. If we failed to follow orders given, the device would be activated. It wasn't much of a threat. You can't threaten a mindless shell incapable of thoughts of their own, but you can stand triumphant, reminding them of their loss of humanity and thought, their free will. Rolling the device between his thumb and finger, the man cleared his throat. Nest your children, he said. Are you ready to meet mother and father? Before we could react, he took pleasure in saying that our activation code one final time, bringing my already empty thoughts to a standstill. Slowly, my mouth stretched into a smile which split my lips apart and I spoke in childlike glee. Next to me, the others did the same. Mommy. And I went again. No fair. The sun was in my eyes. Tell him, Jane. Ah, there is no sun. It was too cold to be playing baseball, but I wasn't going to miss watching my siblings murdering each other over a stupid game. My brother's arguing tore me from the newspaper that I had been reading, sitting on the wooden steps leading into our yard. I had been reading about the poor kitty who had gotten itself stuck up in a tree. Luckily, it was saved. But I couldn't stop thinking about how scared the poor little thing must have been. It had rained the night before. Now, I usually enjoyed the rain. I liked to sit in bed after reading the daily newspaper and pampering my face. I was getting closer to becoming friends with Connor Aislain. We were at the talking stage, which was better than nothing though I had to admit that my younger brother was closer to him. We had a bat. Whoever successfully brought Connor Aisling through our door had complete ownership of the family television for a month, which was a huge deal. All I could think about was the bat as I lifted my head, my gaze flashing across our yard where Peter stood, bat in hand. Johnny was pitching and Jane was sitting several feet away, her head buried in the latest classical novel to catch her eye. My sister was just like me. She never missed an opportunity to watch our brothers at daily baseball games. And I liked to join in usually, but it was far too cold. The ice cold breeze had been blowing my hair back, which was annoying. Mother did tell me not to mess it up. She made it clear that I had to look my best for Connor Aislinn. I had to wrap myself up in mother's fluffy coat and a thick, pink scarf to bear the brunt of fall bleeding into winter. It's not like Peter and Johnny cared about the weather. Both sporting short sleeve shirts, they were bound to get cold. I made a mental note to tell mother. At least Peter was wearing a baseball cap. I focused my attention on him, watching him miss the ball again, and in true Peter fashion, he was already stamping the ground and blaming his bad swing on the wind, trying to snatch his hat. Peter was always the sibling that I paid attention to the most, 
and I wasn't sure why. Looking at him, I was always searching for something which wasn't there, but I felt like it was. Like looking through a foggy mirror and trying to find a face. There was one thing bothering me. I didn't remember that Peter ever had glasses, but I could have sworn that I had accompanied him to the optometrist. Our town didn't even have an optometrist, only a private doctor. However, I definitely have very faint memories of standing in front of Peter and waving around a pair of thick framed glasses. I remember his scowl trying not to be a smile, though my brother's eyes were perfect. He had never had glasses or had mentioned them. Huh. The thought didn't stay with me for long. I shook it away with a chuckle, turning my attention to Jane, who had thrown down her book and jumped up and down when the edge of Peter's bat had finally sent the ball across the yard. Johnny's mouth was slack for a moment, his eyes wide. Peter never hit the ball. The boys called it baseball, but there weren't enough players to have a proper game. Instead, the two of them took turns pitching and then batting and running a lap around our yard. Peter seemed baffled himself. He only snapped out of it when Jane cupped her mouth laughing. Run, you idiot. Peter threw himself into a sprint. He froze, Johnny yelled. Surely that counts for something, right? Come on, he never hits. I cut my own mouth. My hands were ice cold. Wet. Cut him some slack. Johnny twisted to me as expression said in a mocking scowl. Stay out of it, Wendy. I was on the edge of my seat, literally. Johnny took the opportunity to dive for the ball before Peter could complete his lap. So yeah, it was kind of like baseball. Both of them were far too competitive, however, and ended up crashing into each other. I bit back a hiss. That looked painful. The two of them landed with twin oofs on grass thick with mildew, and I was giggling along with them when footsteps on hardwood had alerted me of mother's presence. I had already sensed her coming minutes before she set foot outside, but the game had taken my attention. Jumping to my feet, I nodded at my mother. She wasn't smiling as usual, her expression frozen into permanent impatience. She did smile, but it was rare. Mother only smiled when either of us reported getting closer to Connor Aislinn. We had all worked hard to get to know the family. Mom had gifted them casserole and freshly made pies. Dad had befriended Connor's father through their mutual job, and my siblings and I got close to him at school. In Mother's hands was a casserole. The smell gathered in my nose and throat, and it smelled wonderful. I did notice the sauce looked thicker than usual. Was Mother trying a new recipe? I hope so. Wendy, darling. Mom spoke in a soft breath. Did you invite Connor Aisley into dinner like I had asked? I noticed your grip on the casserole dish tighten. Her hands were quivering a little. Mother's hands had never shook. Connor Aisley is a skinwalker, honey. He must be dealt with accordingly. I nodded, my gaze on Jane's ponytail being whipped around in the sharp breeze. Yes, I invited him. I said smoothly. Connor said that he couldn't attend due to homework. I turned to her with a grin. I did ask to join, but he seemed rather content with being with his own company. Mother inclined her head. Oh, well, isn't that fascinating, hmm? The Aislin boy would rather do homework than try my casserole. He'll come tomorrow, I murmured, spinning around and wrapping my arms around Mother. She smelled like strong cleaning product, and something I couldn't quite name. It was a potent stink, easily snaking its way into my throat. He must try your casserole. It is to die for. Mother's lips twitched into the slightest of smiles, but her hands were visibly shaking now, her entire body rattling and I had no idea why. Of course, she pushed me away gently. Dinner's almost ready. Please tell your brothers and sister. Oh, was mother taking medication? I had wondered, but I didn't think so. 
Maybe she was a nervous or sick, but our family was never sick. Nodding, I cut my mouth with my hands, which were wet. It's funny, it wasn't raining yet. Looking into the sky, clouds were gathering thick and gray on the horizon, but no sign of rain. Dinner's ready, I shouted to the others, and when they protested, I couldn't resist a laugh. Darling, can you come and help me set the table? Mother asked. She was already backing away, the smell of the casserole moving with her. Wendy, Peter jumped to his feet, shoving the other two aside playfully. He held up his baseball cap, waving it. It's your turn. I sent Mother a helpless look, and I expected her to be strict. I expected her to order me inside. After all, it was my duty to help Mother set the table and prepare dinner. But instead, however, Mother stepped back with a smile which didn't suit her. I had never seen her smile like that. Go and play, Becca, she sighed. And her voice was dreamy, eyes unfocused. I will do it myself, and yes, you can use the iPad. Her words struck me for a moment. Becca, that name sounded foreign. Both of the words did. Mother let us watch television before and after school. I wasn't sure what the second word was, it just sounded as alien as Becca. Mother had never said either of those words before. The questioning, however, was gone before I could fully register it. I gave Mother an awkward hug before she had headed back inside and hurried to catch up to the others. Peter passed me the bat and I took my position on the marking that the boys had made themselves with white paint. Taking slow steps back, Johnny's lips curled into a smirk. I thought you didn't want to play, he laughed. Isn't it too cold for you? I rolled my eyes, taking position. Johnny cocked a brow. He mimed, going in slow motion. Oh, you're cold. Do you want me to go as slow as possible? I lifted the bat like I was going to throw it at him, and he burst out laughing. Johnny's laugh was like a hyena, insufferable. Come on, Wendy, Jane yelled. Miss, Peter started chanting, hissing in protest when Jane had shoved him. Ah, oh, Jesus, you've got pointy elbows. Johnny was grinning. I'm not sure what it was about his smug smile, but it only motivated me to actually try. Instead of playing casually, I had situated myself into a proper position, digging my sneakers in the ground and tightening my grip on the bat. I was aware of Johnny pitching the ball and seeing it flying towards me, but I didn't move. Something inside me froze and then impact. Pain exploded. A neutron star collision going off in front of my eyes. I felt my body jolt from the pain before I hit the ground. First on my butt and then dropping onto my back. My head was spinning, the thoughts spiraling. A new pain had started up, crawling around the back of my skull. I could hear my siblings shouting my name and I opened my mouth to say that I was okay, that I hadn't broken any bones when... color. I can't quite explain the sensation. One moment I was staring at a sky which I was used to, and I was staring at the reality I believed in. Birds flying across the sky in trails of white clouds signaling airplanes, and then I was seeing color. I was seeing the bright blue sky, I was seeing trees blossoming in fall beauty smothered in rich browns and reds and dark greens. Blinking rapidly, I struggled to take in explosions of color bleeding into my vision. Color. I had never noticed that I had been living in black and white until I was seeing color. It was enough to bring tears to my eyes and sliding down my cheeks. But I wasn't supposed to cry. I never cried. And yet, my cheeks were wet and my lips had tasted like salt. I was half aware that I was covering my nose and mouth where the pain was which had triggered mesmerizing color. My hands. When I stared at them, they were slick red. I could see my own blood for the first time running down my fingers and staining my palms. It dripped from my nose in rivulets, ruining the dress that I didn't know was pink. I had never stopped to look at my dress, or my pale blue sneakers, or 
locks of sandy colored hair trickling in front of my face. Before I could fully understand and register what I was seeing, more pain had blossomed, worse than before. It was enough to send me flopping back onto the ground. My teeth gritted around a screech at clawing at my throat. I was frowning at an oddly shaped cloud before my surroundings seemed to bleed around me. Vivid colors clashing together into one perceivable vicious noise inside my head. Squeezing my eyes shut, I waited for it all to disappear. Everything, the color, the pain, everything. Instead though, I found myself in the back of a car, like father's, but it was a lot different. For one, the shadow in the front seat, the identity that I couldn't see, didn't have to drive manually. Instead, the car seemed to do it for him. My head was pressed against the glass of the window and I was panting, my chest heaving. I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was choking like there was no oxygen in the air. I was having a panic attack. No. Pain struck again, this time forcing me to remember who I was what I was and where I had come from. The laboratory inside a Markham facility, room 12 of the Nestor family. The body which used to think for herself and have free will. She was having a panic attack. The girl who used to have this body before I was activated. Please, she spoke with a twisted tongue. My old self drew her head back, slamming her hands into the glass. Just... Just let me go in there, she whispered. All I need to do is get to the back rooms, the labs. He'll be in there. The figure in the front seat sighed. I glimpsed a bright red hoodie and dark hair pinned back by Ray-Bans. Are you crazy? He twisted around to face her, his lips curled into a scowl. No. He prodded his seat with emphasis. We wait until the barrier is down, and then we get out of here. The town is crawling with their people. The school isn't safe anymore. They've thrown half of the faculty into Lydia. Oh, sure. Her tone was bitter. Run away, that's what you love to do. He scoffed. Oh, yeah. I am so sorry if we wanted to get away from all of this. I was startled then by emotions flooding inside her. Anger, frustration, pain. What? So you just want to leave him? He groaned, tipping his head back. It's better than waiting to get taken. Have some perspective, yeah. I'm sorry, Kane. The boy was quick to follow her. What? Hey, stop. He grabbed her, yanking her back. You do realize if you go in there, you're not coming back out. He spluttered at a laugh. We already lost half our classmates to them. Do you really want to join them? She wasn't giving up, and I don't think she was thinking straight either. I can get him out of there. The guy who came folded his arms. His tone softened. He's gone. They fabricated a tetanus shot and took half of the seniors in. Stop saying that. What do you want me to say? Kane took a step towards her and then another. His words came out in globules of saliva hitting her face. His words twisted and turning her gut. Do you want me to sugarcoat it? It's not too late, she said. They took him. They took him yesterday. If I can get him there. Oh, please, he curled his lip. I'd rather they throw him in Lydia. A small voice and other me twisted around to see a pair of fluffy slippers thump onto concrete. A little girl with dark hair and sleepy eyes blinked at them. Are you fighting again? Kane rolled his eyes. Why would we be fighting? We're all fine here. Cotton candy and rainbows. Other me shoved him. She's five, she said through her teeth. Hurrying over to the little girl, my other self, the nameless shell shoved to the back of my head, took the little girl's hands. Oh, where are your gloves? The little girl's lips pricked. And the fairies took them. Despite the fear eating up her insides and twisting her inside out, my other self laughed. Okay, I believe you. She chuckled, and in a more serious tone. Kane is going to look after you for a while, okay? Sniffling, she tried to blink away the tears, but they kept coming. And I'm going to get your brothers back. 
Do you understand me? I'm going to get your big brother back from the monster, sweetie. I promise. And Kane hissed out. Wait. Since when was I a babysitter? My other self shot him a glare. It's only until I'm back. I'm sure you can deal with a five-year-old. Really? The little girl whispered, her eyes filling with hope. Her small hands trembled. But Kane said my brother isn't coming back. Well, Kane is being an idiot, she said, and the girl giggled. You're going to be a good girl for him, okay? Her tone was suddenly firm, and when the little girl wrapped her arms around her, she had tightened her grip. Allie, do you remember what I told you earlier? Repeat it back to me. Allie's eyes widened. If mommy or daddy or anyone from your school knock on the door, I have to stay extra, extra quiet. Uh-huh. And Kane is going to be with you. My old self nodded at the boy who pulled a face. Aren't you? He blew a raspberry. Like I'm going to abandon a five-year-old. Better yet, my best friend's little sis. Allie shook her head before whispering in her ear. I don't like Kane's boo-boo. My other self's gaze flashed to the bloody bandage wrapped around the boy's head. No matter how many times he tried to hide it by pulling up his hood, it was always there, edges tinted with red and reminding me that there was a way out. Kane has, he has a bad headache. Allie didn't look too convinced. She got closer, her eyes darkening. Is Kane like mommy and daddy? He's okay, my other self said breathlessly. Allie nodded. Is it all going to be over soon? My other self didn't reply. Instead, she hugged Allie again, before letting the little girl climb into the back seat. You crazy, Kane said, climbing into the driver's seat. He saluted me with two fingers. I'll make sure to make awkward eye contact with you across the street when you've been assimilated into your new family, and to remind this shell of yourself wiped of all you were. She sent him the finger. Well, if I'm going to be erased completely, yes. It was me who stole your GTA game. I knew it. Watching him go, she made sure to smile until Kane was reversing away, headlights blinding her. When she was alone, my other self turned and started to run, pushing herself into a sprint, her sneakers pounding against tarmac. Wendy! Jane's frightened voice sliced into my thoughts, snapping me out of it. Wendy, are you okay? My vision went fuzzy after that. The backdrop of an abandoned parking lot bleeding away, making way for blue sky. No, a black and white sky. Blue, black and white. Blue, black and white. It was like my perception was faltering. I thought the colors would leave, but they stayed, exploding once more. And this time, and drenching my siblings looming over me and bringing them to life with the rest of the world. I didn't know Peter's hair was red until right then. Johnny's hair was more of a chestnut shade, while Jane was a blonde like me. Their faces startled me for the first time, especially when I took a moment to fully take them in. Their expressions were frozen, seemingly varying between three, joyful, horrified, and content. They weren't blinking either. Everything about them seemed forced and robotic, from the way that Peter had reached out his hand for me to take, and Jane stroking her hands through my hair. Jane, her mane of gold locks hanging to my face, was grinning wildly despite her eyes wide with fear. There were scratch marks on her arms, and the buttons on her dress collar had been ripped off. Peter's fingernails were scarlet. There were stains down his shirt. Johnny's cheeks were smeared in varying shades of the same color, but they weren't the only ones. And my hands weren't just covered in fresh blood. They had been stained in tainted scarlet. The dress that I adored was torn and splattered in greenish stains mixed with sharp red. Leaning forward, Johnny's breath smelled rancid. Hello, he flicked my temple, and three colors suddenly flashed in vivid clarity in front of my eyes blue, green, and yellow. I was looking at my siblings underneath the perfect blue sky. I was seeing their faces, but I could sense something different. My hands strapped down in front of me, 
Something sharp and heavy was sticking into the back of my head, triggering my mouth to open and close, try and attempt to scream and fail. Again, a woman's voice slid into my brain, causing my body to jolt. I felt them. I felt each and every electroshock rattling through me and scorching my hands. I felt each one tear apart my sanity and my will to live, to fight, to keep hold of my name. I screamed until blood dripped from my nose and mouth. I screamed until I was so weak that I couldn't lift my head, but she kept going, again and again and again and again. I don't know how long it had been before the word, sister, left my mouth filled with blood. Men and women in white surrounding me nodded and helped me off with the bed. I was pushed towards the door. My feet felt strange and grazing ice cold tiles. I flinched at the feeling for a moment before remembering that I wasn't allowed to flinch. I wasn't allowed to feel the cold. I joined the others, sister, brother, and brother. Are you ready to meet your mom and dad? We nodded. Peter, Johnny, and Jane, and me. The man closed the gap between us, his mouth upturned into a sneer. What happens if you fail in order? Lydia, we said. Good. And what happens when you have obtained and disposed of the target? Self-destruct, of course. Peter smiled and wavered. You were quite clear. Once our mission is cleared, we are set to self-destruct. Very good. Two figures emerged. My mother, a slim blonde wearing a fluffy sweater and jeans. And my father, broad shoulders and a warm smile. Mother held out her arms for a hug and the four of us rushed into her. I caught the back of her head by accident. Where her hair should be was a bald patch. My fingers grazing over warm wetness. Her body lurched in response and her hand shook. Her breath came out in sharp pants against my neck. But she turned it into a laugh. A loud laugh which we all joined in with. And mother tightened her grip on us. The memory bled away once again when mother's hand made impact with my cheek. Wendy Nestor. When I blinked rapidly, she was standing over me. Mother was beautiful in color, her dark hair fell in waves in a bright yellow dress and matching apron. Just like the others, Mother was covered in red too. It painted her and for the first time in a while, I was feeling fear. Get up, she chastised. You are being dramatic. Mother helped me to my feet and my head spun. There was a voice in my head. Laughing. What do you think you're doing? Get up, it's raining. The voice was a stranger and I wonder why it made me cry. Well, mother's arms were folded. What happened? Johnny held up the baseball with a guilty smile. Sorry, mother, we were playing and I hit her in the face. Hit? Before I could stop her, mother was pressing two fingers into my temples, applying pressure. I was seeing the colors again. Mother pressed harder and I had to bite back a scream. Does that hurt? No, I lied. Open your eyes, she ordered. I did. Any colors, flashing lights? Her face pinched. Are you seeing or hearing things that are not there? I gritted my teeth when the colors bathed her, turned her face into a confusing spot of yellow. No. She smiled widely. Wonderful, you're fine, sweetie. Mom gestured to the others. All right, wash up for dinner. Inside the kitchen, there were a lot of things which didn't make sense. Hollowed out bodies hanging from meat hooks. Something sour crept up my throat and I slapped myself on the forehead. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Why was I questioning this? I had been the one to help mother. They were skinwalkers that we managed to lure to our home. The pain followed me burning hot in my head as I struggled to take in blood-splattered countertops into casserole the bubbling intestines in a soup of blood and gravy. Mom was humming and dancing around the kitchen. She put down seven plates on the table and I stopped to count them. There was Jane, Peter, Johnny, Father, me, and Mother. So why seven plates? I watched Mother cut imaginary vegetables. My daughter... 
she was saying in hisses of breath, bringing the blade of the knife down on the chopping board. She was trembling, trying to stabilize herself against the countertop. I can't, I can't remember her name, but I know I have a daughter. I, I have a sweet baby. She was growing more and more hysterical, stabbing the blade into her hand instead. Mother didn't even flinch. She hasn't seen me in a while. No, a long time. A long time, oh, it's been so long. Darling, oh, sweetie, I miss you. Mommy misses you so, so much. Peter took his seat at the table. And Mom, are we having casserole? She turned around, her grin wide. Tears splashing down her cheeks. Yes, oh yes, casserole. Casserole for all of my dear children. The father arrived after that. Hello, family, he said surely, before setting his briefcase on the table and taking out his laptop. We all leaned forward in anticipation. After dinner, we always gave a report. A red-haired woman appeared on the screen. She was scowling. Disgraceful, she spat. I have reports of you butchering normal people, and as of an hour ago, Connor Aislin and his family murdered two people in broad daylight. Your programming must have malfunctioned. No. Mom said in a hearty laugh. No, give us another chance. We will get him. She wrapped her arms around us. Isn't that right, kids? No, I think it's time to say goodbye, the woman said with a sigh. It was a pleasure collaborating with you and Nestor family. We have thousands of other families about to be greenlit inside Markham. Unfortunately, you have become useless. Mother and father's smiles remained, despite their panicked yells. Wait! Her lips formed a merciless smile, curving around her self-destruct to trigger her. Mother dropped first, an explosion in the back of her head, and then father. Seeing mother and father self-destruct only brought more pain that I shouldn't have been able to feel, and accompanied that a memory. This time I was in a classroom. The desks were mostly empty apart from a select few. Kane was at the front, standing on a chair. Whoever these people are, they're in our town, he yelled. They're taking us, our moms and dads, our brothers and sisters, even our grandparents. And what are we supposed to do? A girl leaned on her desk, her eyes raw from crying. What the heck are we supposed to do, Kane? And who put you in charge anyway? A voice yelled from the back. It's a nuclear family factory, come on. What are you guys not seeing? It's right in front of us. A boy in the front jumped up, laughing. His identity was swamped in sunlight, but I could make out a shock of reddish curls poking from his hood. Other me jumped up from her own chair and grabbed his sleeve, yanking him back down. He stumbled awkwardly, slamming back into his seat and almost toppling over. Hey, other me hissed. Are you high? He spluttered. Pfft, no, of course not. Come on. Do you really think I would smoke at a time like this? She rolled her eyes. Yes, this is the perfect time to try and hide away from reality. And you know that you can't do that. And when he didn't respond, she grabbed his sleeve, tugging it. Allie, she needs her big brother. Control your boyfriend, Kane said, rolling his eyes. Anyway, since we're the only ones left, I figured that I should share intel. We can't trust phones or anything technological. Just ourselves. Oh, come on, Kane, other me said. Give us something here. How long until they realize that we're here? The town is being emptied. The guy in front of me said in a more serious tone. Anyone they want is taken in. While the rest... Lydia. They all said at the same time. And Kane cleared his throat. Well, I can't say anything for beating them, but I know how to get out of the self-destruct. What the... Some boy let out an incredulous laugh, and I resisted against the hiss. Roman's laugh drove me crazy. Kane held up the drill. From what I know, this thing is like a root. A digital root that they just put inside her head, which they program, but... He pointed to his own head. I got it. A girl shrieked. 
Wait, they took you. He nodded. Before they start programming their stuff, I had managed to get it out before it could cause any real damage. He held up a stringy piece of metal. A coil. This is the O27. When inserted, it acts as a detonator. He stuck the drill into his temple. Drill until you hit something springy, it's not that deep. Plunge your fingers in and pull it out. He shook his head. I'm not saying that it'll bring you back, it's a pretty permanent process. But it'll remove the bomb that they put inside your head. What do you mean permanent? I mean mind altering permanent. Kane got closer. And the boy in front of me turned around, his identity finally bleeding into view. I recognized him, and his lips formed a smile. Peter. Oh crap, he shot me a teasing grin. Let's hope we don't get taken, yeah? Let's hope we don't get taken, yeah. His voice was in my head at the exact time my gaze had flashed to Peter. I didn't feel anything for him. He was nothing to me but in splinters of my memory he had existed in her life. That's something to the mind wiped from me. The woman was still displayed on the laptop smiling wildly after witnessing the death of mother and father. I'll give the Nestor siblings a little longer, she said with a light laugh. You are children after all, let's call it mercy. The laptop exploded. Peter's voice echoed in my ear as my brain started to boil. Something ran from my nose, but I was too busy looking next to me. The same face in the classroom, Kane's best friend, who other me had risked her life to save. Let's not get taken, yeah. I'm sure you know what I did next. I did exactly what Kane had told me to do, regardless of it sounding ridiculous. I grabbed a rag and bit into it, pressed as much pressure as possible, then drilled until they screaming into the gag until blood was running down my face and neck, screaming against waves of pain hitting me until it hit something. I felt the weight of it. Gritting my teeth, I wrapped my fingers around it and yanked as hard as I could until my fingers were bloody, and a coil of metal, the ends flashing red, was in my fist. It was only when I had managed to remove the 027 from Peter and Jane did I pick up a low, beeping noise. A countdown, I thought. They were getting rid of us and then every trace we had existed. 59. A mechanical voice spoke inside my head. 58. 57. 56. The voice was counting down from 20 by the time that I was dragging them and Johnny over my shoulder and Peter and Jane stumbling my arms. When my feet had touched grass, a blast threw me to the ground and once my face was buried in dirt and mildew, I was laughing until I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was dying, blood seeping from my head and my thoughts dizzy. But the first time in so long, I wasn't able to laugh for myself, think for myself, and with my siblings next to me, I felt content. Three days later and I'm alone. They are not waking up. I am alone and it's not fair. Makeshift bandages are working, but we really need a hospital. Whoever Kane is, he was wrong or at least he was wrong about some things. Removing the 027 does not bring us back. It just removes initial programming. But everything that came after when we were strapped to a chair and forced to forget our names and our lives, that is permanent. Jane, Johnny, and Peter are brain dead. Without commands or that thing inside them, they're nothing. They're just here with me, which makes me wonder. Why am I aware? What happened to me which didn't happen to them? There are things that I need to talk about, like my brother having the same face as someone who meant a lot to other me, but Peter or whoever he used to be is a shell. He and the others are forever awaiting orders. Perfect nuclear children who have reverted back to human without their humanity. I've tried to bring them back. I keep chipping away at them, but I'm scared the deeper that I get. I'm causing more damage than good. My siblings and I are currently in hiding. We can't leave the neighborhood yet. There are guards stationed outside the barriers. Yesterday, they relocated a new family in the house next to ours. They are called the Wilders. The sun looks familiar, but maybe I'm overthinking it. I hope the others wake up soon. 
I don't know if I can keep dragging them around like this. Is there even any point? Why should I be carrying around dead weight? I can see colors again. I still don't know my name, but it will come. I know that it will. And the others will wake up too. I keep writing it and it thrills me to know that we got away. And we are alive. The Nestor family are awake. Another thing I should mention. The wilder sun keeps catching my eye while I'm scavenging for supplies. I wonder if he's awake. I am a retired Army Special Forces operator who has 20 years of experience under my belt. Ten of those years were spent with the Scout Rangers conducting jungle reconnaissance, covert operations, raids, hostage rescue, and all the other special operation tasks that you would expect from elite military formations like SR. Meanwhile, the other 10 years was dedicated to hunting down mythical and paranormal creatures and employing said creatures against internal and external threats to the nation. Now I can bore you with stories of my first 10 years in the Rangers, but I doubt that that would be anything new from these stories that you've already heard special forces operators do. Go behind enemy lines, stay undercover for weeks on end, Raid enemy camps. Those are all the usual stories that have been told by others before me. So instead of telling my experiences there, I'll instead go straight to the one that I'm sure has piqued your interest. My ten years working with mythical and paranormal creatures. The idea of using mythical and paranormal creatures may seem strange at first. However, it has been a practice that has been an armed forces doctrine for nearly seven decades now, and I doubt that they have plans of removing it anytime soon. It is an effective method of clearing an area of enemies, and although mistakes can result in catastrophic problems, such occurrences are few. Now, I'm not saying that mistakes rarely happen, because a good number of them happened in the past. However, their numbers are small enough that not many people take note of them. Besides, since operations often happen in isolated areas and hostile insurgent territory, any unexpected casualties from nearby innocent civilians can easily be blamed on the local insurgency. Now, I can go into more detail about the cover-up campaigns and the screening operations made by the government to hide their use of mythical and paranormal creatures. But that task is assigned to another special operation group of the armed forces. I'm not exactly sure of what their operations are, or how their operations group is run, but I do know that they are effective in their job. Anyways, getting back on track. My special operations group is known as the Mythical and Paranormal Warfare Operations Group, the MPWOG although we just refer to it as the MPOG, since it's less of a mouthful. You're probably thinking that I'm crazy right now for saying this and I can't blame you. If I heard of such a thing all those years ago, I would have laughed too if I had heard of such a group. It sounds outrageous and silly. I mean true, the armed forces use psychological warfare to trick insurgents that creatures like asswings were out to get them. But those were nothing more than just props and sounds, not actual mythical creatures. However, if it weren't for the fact that I encountered Empog during one of those few accidents that I was talking about, then I would have never thought that the government really used creatures of pure evil to fight its enemies. It happened sometime around 1988. Back then, my scout ranger company was deployed at Southern Luzon to assist Regional Unified Command foreign operations against the communist insurgents in the area. Patrolling the various jungle covered mountains in the region, we would spend weeks out in the field, trying to locate any trails that led to the insurgent camps. Because of the dense jungle in the area, it wasn't too hard for the enemy to conceal their camps from aerial observation. Unable to locate insurgent bases from the air, it was up to us rangers to hunt them down. 
However, on one of our nightly hunts, we had encountered something that would change the rest of my career. Trekking through the mountainous jungle, trying to keep as silent as possible, my squad went through an unmarked path, hoping to find any evidence of insurgent activity. The plan was to find as many tracks as possible until they led us to the main camp. This was easier said than done, but we like to pride ourselves at being good at these kinds of jobs. All around us were a dense concentration of trees and a slippery, muddy ground. While just a few meters away, on both of our flanks, were various mountain caves that ominously stared at us. From my position near the head of our column, I did my best to constantly glance towards the caves, being mindful to note any sign of movement. In such places were perfect hiding spots and there was no way of telling if an insurgent was hiding inside, ready to come out and fire a long burst of automatic rifle fire. Despite being special forces, night vision goggles were pretty rare back then, especially for us field units. And because of this, we had to rely on our eyes, the moonlight, and our refined instincts in order to feel what was in our surroundings. A few hours into our patrol, my point man, a PFC Gomez, reported seeing smoke a few meters ahead of us, immediately ordering a halt. I told my squad to take a defensive position and keep their eyes open for a potential ambush. After that, I quietly made my way forward until I had reached Gomez, who was crouching down by some underbrush. What's up ahead? I asked in a whisper as I crouched down next to him. He pointed towards a tree up ahead of us. You see that big tree over there? Well, when the wind blew and it caused the leaves of the trees ahead of us to begin to sway, I managed to get a quick and clear view of its top, and I noticed there was smoke coming from it. From on top of the tree, I asked, squinting my eyes to stare at where he was pointing at. Are you sure? I'm sure, just wait for the wind. And so I did. Soon enough, a strong breeze came along, making the many branches of the trees around us sway, opening up the curtain of leaves that had earlier blocked my line of sight. Through that small opening, I had just managed to see the top of the big tree that Gomez was pointing at, and right on top of it was a trail of smoke. Reflecting from the moonlight, a trail of thin white smoke emitted from inside a wall of large leaves atop the tree as it were a chimney. I found this odd and I remember thinking how strange it was for someone to make camp on top of a tree, but I quickly shrugged off my doubts as I realized that it could be an insurgent lookout who was using the tree as a safe outpost to guard the perimeter. I had never encountered such a situation before, but it made sense to me at the time. A large tree provided a safe, concealed place from where a sentry could stay for the night and observe the ground below him. And with that in mind, I convinced myself that it was indeed probably an insurgent there who had stupidly lit a fire on top of his tree or had carelessly decided to smoke a cigarette. Whichever of the two, it gave away his position. The presence of an outpost like that could have been a sign that we were close to the camp. Emboldened by this, I decided to push my squad forward to further investigate the area and gather more intelligence. Following behind Gomez, I kept my eyes on the tree, looking for any sign of movement. The rest of the squad followed behind us, all alert and ready to engage in case something bad happened. And then all of a sudden, I heard the sound of rustling leaves and bending branches. Quickly reacting to this, I aimed my rifle forward and pointed it towards the big tree ahead of us. By then, we were only 10 meters away from the tree, and I was afraid that the insurgent noticed our approach and hurriedly got down to make an escape. However, when I scanned the area near the tree, I saw no person nearby. Thinking that he had managed to escape and run for home, I let out a curse of frustration. In my mind, I assumed that he would soon be informing his superior of our presence, and we would then have a patrol sent against us. 
Not wanting to risk any action with such a small forest, I began planning our escape. However, before I could give out any orders, a deep and old voice spoke loudly from our right. You are not supposed to be here. It said firmly, making me almost jump from my position. Out of instinct, I immediately pointed my weapon at the source of the sound, and the rest of my squad did the same. At first, I couldn't actually see the source of the voice. However, as I searched these shadows, my eyes soon fell on something that made my spine shiver in fear. Through the dim light of the moon, I managed to see a bulky and naked man, with his skin so dark that he almost seemed like a shadow. Scanning his body, I couldn't help but notice how large and grotesque his arms and legs and torso were. The muscles on them were large and seemingly deformed, and giving him a shape that seemed odd and unsettling. Soon, fixing my gaze upon his face, I then saw two wide white eyes staring back at me with an unnatural aura that made my heart nearly stop in fright. I don't scare easily, so I was surprised at how scared I was feeling during that moment. Studying the person before me, I was unsure why he looked so strange and so frightening. I felt uneasy just to stand before him, and I had to fight the urge to step back and bolt away from him. I was confused by this and didn't know why I was so scared. Trying my best to keep my composure, I tried to push away further thought of fear as I spoke up towards the person who had stumbled upon us. Who are you? I asked, keeping my sights strained on him, as I kept a stern grip on my weapon. What are you doing here? It responded to my question by laughing. In a very rough tone, it let out a deep laugh, as if it was mocking me for asking him such questions. Normally, I would have been angry at such a taunt, but instead I felt scared. Watching him carefully, I then saw his hand move to grab something, forcing me to act on my instincts. Don't move. Keep your hands on your sides. I shouted, but he simply ignored me. In my mind, I thought he was grabbing for a gun or worse, a grenade. Reacting as fast as I can, I quickly pressed the trigger of my rifle. However, to my surprise, I found myself unable to do so. Trying to will my finger to pull the trigger, I realized that I could not do it. The simple act, one that I have done countless times, could not be done. As if some kind of invisible force was preventing me, I found my finger frozen and stopped. And then I noticed that my squad was not reacting to the strange man's movements. I knew them each one of the rangers in my squad, and I knew that they too would have instantly pulled the triggers of the rifles and shot the man, yet not a single shot was fired. Finding my body frozen and my heart pumping fast in fear, I was surprised to find that I was still able to turn my head. Looking left and right, I saw each member of my squad as seemingly frozen, as if we were all stuck in a pose of pointing our guns at the man, but unable to do anything else but turn our heads. Studying the expressions of the rangers closest to me, I could see the fear plastered on their faces, the same fear that I knew was on mine. Trying to mask the fear with anger, I could hear a chorus of curses coming out of their mouths as they tried to comprehend what was happening. I too would have let out a curse, but the remaining calm part of my mind told me that it wouldn't have done anything to change the situation. So instead of shouting, I remained silent and returned my focus to the strange man. Checking what the man had grabbed, I was surprised and confused to see that he had picked up a thick lit cigarette, whose smoke and stench freely floated in the air. Placing the cigarette in his mouth, he then looked at each one of us and gave an unsettlingly large smile, which revealed teeth that were as white as his eyes. I'm not supposed to let anyone pass through this trail, it told us in its deep voice. Then it began to move closer towards us. None of you should be here. Still unable to move, we were left helpless. One of my rangers, a PFC Dominguez, found himself being approached directly by the strange man. 
Watching the man as he approached Dominguez, I could see him smile at the ranger and blow a thick cloud of smoke towards his face, making the ranger cough. After coughing out the smoke that he had hailed, Dominguez turned his head to give the man a long look before turning his head towards me. Sergeant, I think, he began, his voice shaky as both me and the strange man stared at him. I think he's a copre. A copre, a creature known to lurk in the jungles and mess around with those who travel through them. We had all heard the stories as kids, and as I stared at the man before us then, then I still found it hard to believe that the man before was a copre. That small part of my brain tried to rationalize what was actually happening, as I thought that copres were nothing but mythical creatures. They couldn't possibly exist. I fought the urge to believe what Dominguez had said and instead thought that what really was before us was an insurgent. Somehow this insurgent had administered some sort of airborne chemical agent that had paralyzed our bodies and prevented us from moving. That was what I tried to convince myself. I would have held on to that belief if it were not for the events that happened next. Staring sharply at Dominguez with his large eyes, I saw the man's expression change from amused to hurt, and then to angered. Feeling my blood chill, I felt my fear rise up as he moved his face closer towards Dominguez until his eyes were staring directly at him. Don't you ever dare call me a capre, its deep voice shouted, the noise seemingly echoing all around us. You will pay for what you said. And then he moved his head to stare at each one of us, scanning our faces and glancing at our eyes. You will all pay for being here tonight. None of you are supposed to be here. Trying to comprehend what he meant, I suddenly felt my thoughts interrupted when my hands suddenly began to move against my will. Unable to stop them, I let out a curse as I felt my hands loosen its grip on my rifle, before having one hand move towards the holster of my sidearm. My eyes went wide when I felt my hand grip my pistol and pull it out of the holster. Being willed by something else, my hands then switched off the safety of the pistol before raising the weapon up. Realizing what was happening, I tried my best to fight my own uncontrollable hand. Don't resist it, the copper said, his voice low and seemingly everywhere. Do it. Don't fight back. Let your desire end the pain. Using all the willpower that I had, I fought and fought, trying to tell my own hand not to obey the copper as well. To my surprise, my efforts seemed to be doing something, as the smooth movement of my hand suddenly slowed as if encountering resistance. Feeling encouraged, I closed my eyes and tried to blot out the voice of the copre, but suddenly got knocked off my concentration when I heard three loud gunshots. My senses returned to my surroundings and my ears then caught three firm thuds around me, and I soon realized what it was. Corporal Villanueva, PFC Gomez, and PFC Ronaldo all carried sidearms. If they were being willed to do the same thing my own hands were trying to do to me, then it means that they had lost the fight. Unable to spare a second degree for them, I tried to return my focus to my own battle. However, I was once more distracted by the shouts and curses from the remaining members of my squad. PFC Dominguez, PFC Hernandez, and PFC Isidro did not have sidearms, but they did carry combat knives for covert operations. The horrible image of that filled my mind as I realized that this was a much worse fate compared to being taken out by your own sidearm against your will. Listening to their battle, I felt my heart drop as they cried out in anger and frustration. Letting out screams, they fought hard to save their lives, but it sounded like a losing battle. Join your friends, the copre said, his words ringing in my ears. It is time to rest now, so let it be and don't fight back. Death will be swift and peaceful. A succession of sharp stabs could then be heard, followed by gurgling sounds after each one. I knew where their knives went, and I felt heartbroken as each one of them fell to the ground, leaving me as the only one left in my squad. 
With my heart broken and my mind sufficiently distracted, my uncontrollable hand was able to gain some advantage, as it managed to move the barrel of my pistol closer to my temple. Emotionally drained by the loss of my rangers, a small part of me felt that I should give in and let this unknown force make my hand take me out. But I was a stubborn person and I kept fighting. I knew that it was losing the fight and that it was only a matter of time before the pistol got a good angle against me. But I would not just give in so easily. I wanted to fight until the last second, just like my rangers did. Trying my best to return my will to my hand, I concentrated as much as I could, trying to avoid any distraction. This, however, proved harder than expected, as the copre moved itself in front of me and stared. Chuckling deeply as it watched me, it stared right into my eyes. By doing this, I found it harder to fight my hand, as the copper gave some sort of invisible power to ensure that I would lose. Your friends are waiting for you, he said. What's the point of living without them? Join them, join them, join them. Cursing it over and over, I allowed my rage to give me strength to resist for just a bit longer, but each second brought the barrel of my pistol closer and closer to my temple. I was now losing strength and sheer anger and force of will would not prevent my oncoming death. However, just before the barrel could move the last inch towards my temple, I suddenly felt the unseen control of my hand loosen and then disappear. Taken by surprise by this, I looked forward towards the copper to see him stare at something behind me before slowly backing away. As he retreated, I felt the wonderful sensation of being able to control my body once more. Feeling suddenly weak as my will was returned, I almost collapsed onto the ground. However, I managed to maintain enough strength to keep myself up. As I watched the copper move backwards before turning around to make a sprint in what looked like in an attempt to escape. But before it could get away, it suddenly stopped, as if someone had blocked its path. Before I could find out what had stopped it, I suddenly heard the sound of footsteps behind me. Instinctively, I turned around and suddenly saw three figures approaching me. At first, I mistook the dark silhouettes approaching me as more capres. However, I soon realized that these figures were smaller. A careful study of them reassured me that they were not creatures of the unknown, but instead fellow humans. But as I studied them, I couldn't help but wonder who they were. The three men had black battle dress uniforms, and they made them easily blend with the night. Staring at them as they approached, I noticed all three of them had their weapons drawn and ready. However, I also noticed that each one of them had a hand raised. Focusing on their raised hands, I noticed that they were all holding a large bottle with a silver-colored material inside of it. For a moment, I wondered what was inside that bottle before letting my thoughts drift and wonder who these men were. Inspecting the gear on them, I was impressed to see that they were fully kitted for combat and night operation, and aside from the fact that they lacked a helmet, they seemed to remind me of combat-ready American soldiers. With night vision goggles on their faces, ballistic vests protecting their torso, and a vest filled with rifle magazines and grenades, they looked nothing like the common field soldiers in the armed forces. Due to their luck, I initially mistook them as American Special Forces who somehow stumbled upon my predicament. However, a quick greeting and tag-along quickly threw away my assumption, as I soon realized that these men were Filipino. Hey, are you alright? One of them asked as he approached me. Yeah, I managed to reply, my voice shaky. Lifting my hand, I saw that it was shaking also. The battle had taken its toll, both on my mind and body. Good, he told me, with a hint of relief in his voice. You're one lucky person, you know that. Moving closer to check on me, he soon pulled me aside so I could find a place to sit and rest. As he did this, I was able to look at the ground around me to see six bodies lying on the ground. I felt a pang in my heart as I saw them. My whole squad was dead now, and emotions swirled inside me at the thought of it. 
As I sat down and tried to reflect on what happened, I suddenly remembered the creature that caused all of this trouble and turned my attention towards the direction that I last saw him. Still standing in the same spot, I saw the copre remained unmoving in his position as another group of black cladded soldiers emerged from the darkness, weapons drawn and ready. Although I had a hard time seeing clearly in the night, I did note that this group also had raised hands and I knew that this meant that they too were carrying these same bottles filled with silver colored material. As these men got closer to the copre, the creatures seemed to hiss in anger at each step they took. However, unlike his earlier arrogance and dominance, the copre looked helpless against the new arrivals. Once more my curiosity was ignited as I wondered why these men were and what was so special about these bottles that these men carried. As I sat there and watched, I took in what I could and hoped that I would at least get some answer from them later on. After a while, most of the black clad men formed a circle around the copre, while one detached himself from the main group and walked towards me. As he got closer, he took a quick glance towards my fallen rangers before doing a sign of the cross. I'm sorry about your friends, he told me. I'll detail one of the squads to recover them once we secure our target. You mean the copre? I inquired. Yeah, but that's not a copre. Never mistake it as one. They hate it when you do that, he said, gesturing towards the terrible monster behind him. What that is, is Agta. Similar to a copra, yes, but only native to the eastern VCIs. Unlike copras, they're more hostile and can get very dangerous. But they're easy to control once you get mercury near them. Is that what you were carrying in those bottles? I asked. Yeah, he said, before continuing his explanation. Mercury has this magical effect on them that weakens their power. And Agta can seduce you to do things you don't like. But if you have mercury on you, then it is unable to use its power or strength. Well, that's good to know, I said, making a note to always bring mercury with me in any future patrol. However, as he explained the creature to me, there was one thing that nagged my mind. Taking my chances, I decided to ask him in hopes of getting an answer. You said that Agtas were native to Eastern Visayas, right? So what is it doing here in Luzon? Because we brought him here. He told me plainly. You brought him here, I said, nearly shouting it. Eyes wide in shock. I felt more confused than ever. Why would you bring a terrible creature like that here? I felt rage boil inside of me at the thought of what they had done. You're soldiers too, aren't you? You're supposed to protect the country, not spread harm within its borders, I said. Although at the time I wasn't really sure if they were soldiers like me. For all I knew, they could actually be members of a private army for some kind of organization that collects these creatures. Hey, easy now, it's not like we had a choice, he explained. The orders came from the AFP chief who ordered MPOC to deploy C-90109, since he thought the act would be an effective way of countering insurgent movements in the area. Well, he did a good job for the first few nights, but apparently his habit of mischief made him forget that our deal meant that he could only target members of the insurgency. He was out of line for targeting your man, and I apologize that our operations group did not realize the danger sooner. This was our first time deploying an act on maybe the last. I stared at him for a moment and took in what he said. However, out of all the things that he said... There was one thing that stuck out the most that I couldn't help but continue to think about. What's MPOG? And with that, he began telling me about the operations group and how they used mythical and paranormal creatures for various clandestine operations. He was a lieutenant that I had learned, and his platoon was one of the few elite units trained at deploying and capturing creatures and entities through the use of special methods and equipment. At first, I didn't want to believe him. But then again, how could I not believe him when one of the very creatures they used had attacked me and killed my squad? At the end of his explanation, I found myself with a new view of the world. As if my eyes were now open, 
And I now realized that there were more things that lurk in the darkness of the jungle than just insurgents. This scared me a lot. And I realized that I suddenly felt thankful for the fact that an organization like MPOC existed to make sure that such creatures and entities did not wreak havoc upon these cities, towns, and burials of the country. Why tell me all this? I finally asked him. If your operations group is supposed to be a secret, why reveal so much information to an outsider like me? I looked at him and through the faint light of the moon, I saw a grin form on his face. Because I see potential in you. I've never seen someone with a strong enough will to resist the deathly seductions of an Agta. Because of that, I know MPOG would have a place for you. The recruitment season is coming up soon and the operations group only sends invitations to those who we think will qualify. Once the offer arrives, I hope you take it. And with that, he gave me a small nod before walking away. A few minutes later, the rest of the MPOG forces arrived to help secure the area and contain the Agta. Later that morning, I was returned to the army camp with me and my squad had left the night before. The official story was that my squad was ambushed by insurgents, and that I was able to hold out until reinforcements had arrived to recover me and the bodies of my rangers. For this, I was awarded the Gold Cross. However, knowing the true events, I felt unworthy to receive the award. This was my first encounter with mythical creatures in Empog, but it was definitely not the last. Two months after the encounter, I received a letter inviting me for the MPWOG qualifications. I accepted it and thus my career in the operations group began. You're probably wondering what this letter has to do with you. Well, the lieutenant I met during the night of the Agta encounter was your father. He would eventually become my commanding officer and in later years a good friend. Now I know you're really curious about who he really was and what happened to him so I'll tell you about his deeds and his ultimate faith. But I need to make sure first that you believe me. I don't want to waste time and energy writing a letter that you might just crumple up and throw away. So, if you get this and believe what I'm saying, then I suggest that you write back to me and I'll tell you all about your father's time at MPOG. This letter was recently sent to me and I need help figuring out what to do next. For a few months now, I've been collecting various notes and journals of my father in order to create a biography in his honor. My father was a scout ranger who achieved the rank of major before passing away in an operation that was deemed so secret that until today, me and my family still don't know what exactly happened. As part of the biography, I had asked various colleges of my father to write letters about their experience with him. I have received dozens of letters from his old army friends, but this one stuck out the most. At first I didn't know if I should believe him. Everything he said didn't make sense. My father was a scout ranger, not some special forces operator that worked with mythical creatures that don't exist. However, the letter came with a photo. In that photo were two uniformed men posing next to some kind of makeshift sandbag bunker and both men had patches with the MPOG written on it. One of the men was my father. Do you guys think I should write him back? Hi, my name is Alex and I live in this rather small farming town. We have a church on the hill and one very local grocery store and somehow there's a Dollar General too. Life here is rather simple and easy. I wake up, I turn on my studio, and I broadcast music for the town. It's nothing special. Just a classic rock and some country, but I make decent money off it. One thing I noticed our signal never goes past is the town borders. My only guess is that there's something to do with the magnetosphere, but I'm no scientist. About a year ago, around the middle of August... Something weird started happening. Military trucks and other large equipment started showing up in town. They took over the church as a base of operations. They even put large fences and barbed wire all around it. Whatever they were doing must have been serious. It wasn't but a few days after they did that they started testing the air raid siren that we have. 
The only way to really get to it was in my shed, as I owned the radio station, and enough power supply to run the siren, and the station if there was a blackout. So, guess what the boys did? If you said, annexed my station and shed, you are correct. It wasn't really a big deal, they sounded like they needed it for something. And they'd been paying me twice what I was making, so I'm not really angry at all. So, I've been staying at my little brother's and his new wife's home for the past few years. The day that I moved in, it was all nice and happy. Until at exactly 1pm. All the military guys started corralling all the people to their homes in a rush too. They seemed scared like the whole lot of them had seen a ghost. It's a silly thought, I know. However, they weren't taking no's as they were really rough with the townsfolk. Looking through the blinds, I see that they were all done getting everyone in their houses. Maybe they're running some sort of test. Well, it turns out that less than 10 minutes after that, we hear the siren go off. Stay inside and go to the nearest room without windows. If you can't, close the blinds and cover your ears and eyes. This is not a drill. Do not leave for any reason. If someone is caught leaving, they will be marked as a threat. If you hear knocks at the window or door, do not answer it, even if it's family or friends and even if they are in a dire situation. Again, this is not a drill, and we will let you know when to come out. It went on with this same message for a few hours. I was in my room, which luckily is located in the basement. I could hear someone upstairs slamming on the doors, and I could hear my brother talking to his wife. We gotta check, honey. It's my friend, Aaron, he said in a hushed tone. I slowly walk up the stairs and hearing his wife say, Well, here... Take your gun and at least be ready for anything. As I got to the top of the stairs, I creaked the door open to see what is going on. Aaron, I'm going to open the door, but you gotta run in fast, okay? I can hear a muffled. Hey, 10 4, buddy. It wasn't Aaron. It was something deep sounding that I felt. Immediate fear, and I closed my door before they opened their front door. I heard Aaron say, and ye shall overthrow their altars, and break their pillars, and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods, and destroy the names of them out of that place. After that, I heard shots fire. It was my brother, I'm sure of it. His wife Sammy was screaming and tried to come into the basement with me, but I locked the door. I heard the false Aaron walk up to Sammy as she was screaming. It was then that I heard the cracking and twisting of bone. Her cries went silent and so did the home. I could hear Aaron eating. I kept my face covered as the smell wafted through the air. I could see what was left of them flowing through the bottom of the basement door. It wasn't long when I heard this thing knock at my door. I know you can hear me, child. Do not be afraid, as we are here to cleanse these sinners, leaving only the saints. You are not a sinner. You can let me in. I didn't know what to do. I was frozen, but it felt like it was speaking into my brain. The sound of horns were ringing in my head. Child... You cannot ignore me. I am all that was and will be. I know you. I uncovered my ears and checked up the stairs. I noticed the door got unlocked, so I yelled back. What did you do to my brother? What is it that you want? At this point, I'm nearly pissing myself in fear. Your brother and his wife committed a grave, unforgivable sin. We cannot let it slide. Let me in, child. You need not be afraid. I sat there thinking and I slowly walked up the stairs. It felt autonomous and I couldn't stop my own movement. There is no fighting this. You are a saint and you will obey and listen. I do not know what to do at this point. What did he mean that I'm a saint? It was then that I slowly started to twist the doorknob, 
At full force, the sirens were wailing once again, and I regained my consciousness and composure. I quickly locked the door again and ran down the stairs. I could hear the thing say, We will meet again, my child. Go now, on God's good grace. This voice was loud and thundered in my head, leaving my ears to ring. I could only hear the siren afterward, and what sounded like giant wings flapping in the distance. Civilians, the coast is clear. I repeat, the coast is clear. We ask you to stay in your home so we can do some research. Please bear with us a little longer, thank you. It clicks off and these sirens start to die down. It wasn't but a few minutes when I hear, Oh my god, they've got another. Search the house for any survivors. I slowly opened the door and yelled, I'm alive, please help me. It was then that the door swung open as a large man pulled me into the kitchen. I found myself around five men armed to the teeth pointing guns at me. Test him, one guy said. I was immediately shoved against the wall and the guy, testing me, grabbed my arm and stuck a small needle and injected something. What are you doing to me? They all stared at me, waiting for a reaction, however, nothing happened. They all collectively sighed in relief and the one that tested me said, You're coming with us. We have to ask you some questions. I looked around and the bodies of my brother and sister-in-law weren't there. All I could see was a black ash scattered throughout the kitchen and by the front door. What happened to them? I asked. They seemed to ignore my question and we walked outside. I could hear crying throughout the town. It looked like entire families were just erased out of existence. Some people never came out to look around. They were all probably scared out of their mind. I'm not even sure how many disappeared, but it had to have been in the dozens. We arrived at the old church. They opened up the front gate and they let us in. I can see that it was being patrolled by drones. Everywhere that I looked, there is a camera and no one was stationed outside. We get inside and it looks like they removed all the pews on the altar. Countless days I spent praying with my brother in these very halls. Running around the pews after hours while our father talked to the priest, I started to cry. I missed the little brother I once raised and played with. Seeing all that stripped and replaced by all kinds of machines, cables, and chairs. Almost a hundred different monitors, each with a person watching hours of surveillance footage. My brother gets slaughtered like a lamb and now this. It was way too much to handle. I broke into tears and so I shouted, Okay, I'm here now, so what the heck do you want? Sir, we know this is all too much, but we have to talk to you. I calmed down a little. I never was a confrontational, so I took a deep breath and I kept following them. They led me into the basement. There was high-end security scanning their eyes and it looks like a robot arm came out of the wall and poked them with a needle. Must be the same stuff that they had used on me. We passed through the security and walked down a hallway to a room at the end. This was the pastor's room. He had lived in the church, but he had passed a few years back. He was a good man. It feels kind of wrong going into his room. How many hours had this man poured into his community to save us in a time of sorrow? I remember it like it was yesterday. My father passed away when I was 16 leaving the radio station to me. I remember the priest here consoled me and said, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. It was a beautiful funeral. The whole town came by and hugged my brother and I, and we only had each other at this point, so I made it my mission to always take care of him. I saw the photo my dad and the priest took together. He was so happy back then before mom ran off. He was hardworking and always gave his time to help others in need. A good man. I'm happy that I got to know my father, 
and remember talking to the priest in this room about some of the funny things about him. The memories come flooding back and I began to whelp a little. I took a deep breath, in and out. I had to swallow my feelings down as I was disassociating. It was then that I was asked to sit at the old oak table and to wait here. The man who had escorted me here asked if I needed anything. Uh, a coke? I said, quietly holding my face in my hands. Uh, got it. The officer left the room. A few minutes later, someone else entered with two cokes and a notepad. Hello. He looked at his notepad. Alex, I'm the leader of this op and we have some questions about what you saw. Here, you asked for a coke, right? He handed it to me and I took it, opened it, and took a large gulp after I let out a sigh. I want to know where my brother and sister-in-law are before I answer anything. The man looked me in the eyes and took his sunglasses off, and I saw his eyes. They were all white like he had, cataracts. Your brother and sister-in-law are gone. We cannot help them now. He sighed and rubbed the back of his neck. Then you survived and resisted. We need to know why. I slammed my hands on the table. No, people don't just disappear. He tossed a file that he was holding in the notepad to me. Read. It'll explain everything. I opened the file. Inside was a series of pictures and notes. The pictures looked to be giant winged bees of just floating eyes and wings. This was in front of my home. I started to sweat and I turned to the next image. The bees changed shape into Aaron. And then the last picture was it grabbing my, bro my brother's head and ripping it off. I remember dropping the pictures and throwing up on the floor. What is that thing? The man put his glasses back on and handed me a tissue. It's an angel, Alex. Your brother and sister-in-law committed a sin. I'm sorry, but they're gone. We don't know where they took them, but it looks like that they're just gone. With no trace but black ashes that aren't even made of carbon. It's an element that we have yet to classify. I got myself together and asked, Why are you guys wanting to talk to me then? I didn't do any of this. He pointed to the file and said, Keep looking. As I was flipping through, the angel turned back to its normal form. And you can see straight into the home past the kitchen to the door that I was behind. But I wasn't. I was in front of the door. And I was staring at it. Why? Why didn't it attack me? The agent took the files back and said, Very few people survive this. So let's get down to the point. You are a saint. Somehow you are on a whitelist with these things. And so far, you and I are the only known ones. He sighs and says, That's why we came here. To find you. Everyone else in this town is either gone or scared out of their mind. We have to make them forget everything. I grabbed my head in confusion. Running my hands through my jet black hair. In a feeble attempt to calm myself. Why me? I said quietly. I could feel my heart racing. Heat was rushing to my face. You never committed a sin, and it's physically impossible for you to do as well. You can continue your life here, or you can choose to come with us. But in a year, they will come back. I thought to myself, I've got nothing left. My family is all gone, and my job was taken from me. I want to stay, but I feel like I'm safe with these people. I can... Can we wait a year to see what happens? I asked shakily. Yes. We will monitor the area. However, every year on August the 16th, this will happen again. We already sealed the area around the town off so no radio communication can enter or leave this place. We may ask you to come out during the event so we can monitor you. I took another large drink of my soda. Okay, I'll do it. With the idea of talking to the thing that took my only family away, I was furious. 
Shortly after, I was released and I went home. It's July now and nothing has happened since, and the missing townsfolk were replaced with agents, but no one other than me seemed to notice. Life has been normal and I was allowed to use my radio again. I'm counting down the days until this happens again. Will I be prepared? How can I stop them? I don't know. What I know is that the days draw closer, and I can hear the whispering of them above, and I know that they're watching. Once they come down here, I will know where my brother is. My brother and his wife's screams are burned into my brain. Another issue is the trumpets are getting louder, and I'm starting to hear chanting and bells chiming. It's day in and day out, nonstop. I've been contemplating ending it. I find myself about to go down that hole of no return and welcome the release of death. However, anytime I get brave enough and I'm about to do it, I black out. I wake up usually on my bed, where I was sitting before thinking about doing it. Whatever is going on, whatever these things want is beyond me. And that's not the worst of it. It's when I sleep that's when, that's when the true nightmare begins. I feel like if I tell you guys this, it may help me cope just a little bit. The last message I sent out, everyone was rather nice. It's so much to unpack and if you have a weak stomach, please skip ahead if you want to. It all started last night. My dream while nightmare began with just a black canvas. It was just me mindlessly drifting in a seemingly infinite void. But I couldn't wake up or move. That's all there was, just me in the dark floating. I started to panic, as it still to this very minute feels real and with that, it felt like this won't ever end. In my head, what felt like decades pass as I float in pure darkness with only my thoughts. It wasn't much longer, maybe a year or two, it's hard to tell to be honest, that I started seeing something in the distance slowly approaching me or was I approaching it. In the distance, there was a long hallway with no end. The hallway looked like the hospital halls that I used to frequent. It reminded me of how my dad lost his life to cancer. All the years that we spent, the countless hours crying and praying for him to get better. So yeah, I know these halls as if they were my home. It was scary how accurate this was, down to the light blue stripe and the off-white color of the walls. I finally floated to this hall and landed on the floor. I kept looking at the checkered patterned floor, thinking to myself on how life would be different if my father had survived, if my mother never ran away, would my brother still be alive? Sorry for getting a little emotional, I just have to let you guys know exactly how it was. I decided to swallow my fears and judgment. As I walked down the hall, the only sound was my heavy footsteps echoing in the vast emptiness. After what seems like miles of walking, I came across the door. It, it's my father's room. I see a light on at the bottom of the door, and I can hear something else. It was my dad calling out to me. And so, I rushed through the door and saw my dad looking like he did long ago, young and healthy. I instantly rushed in and hugged my father. His cologne smelled as strong as it used to. His hug back was warm and inviting. I haven't felt this happy in my life. There, there, champ. My, oh my, you've grown. Look at how strong you are. You're as strong as an ox. My father said robustly. Thanks, Papa. I've been working on it a lot to help with depression. You don't know about losing you was the hardest thing in my life. Well, where's little Donnie? I missed him too. My dad tried to look behind me at the door, expecting my goofball brother to burst in. Pops, Donnie. And before I could say a word... He jumps out of the closet and yells, Dad, you're alive. I don't know how to process this. I saw my brother's ashes. Donnie, how are you even here? 
My brother looked at me. I don't rightly know how to be honest. I was opening my door for my buddy Aaron, and the next thing I know, I fell out of the closet. As my brother and father hug and catch up, I take a few deep breaths and ran my fingers through my hair, trying to find a way to tell my brother what happened. As I turn around and open my mouth, I hear the trumpets in full force. My head feels like it was going to explode. It was then that I see a grotesque, massive wing circling astronomical rings. On these rings were bloodshot red eyes of varying sizes and colors. Its very presence was distorting space around it. Its mere existence was causing my eyes to blur and my mind to raise. As it spoke to me, I could see the axis of all creation emerging and twisting. I was able to manage to say, What do you want? The being stopped moving. The sound of its rings were making was akin to rusty metal being wrapped. The song of metal scraping against metal is all that I can hear. And in an instant, I heard nothing. The darkness was all gone. I looked around and time was frozen. And all there was, was me and it. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places, wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods, upon the higher mountains, upon the hills, and upon every green tree. It spoke to me. It felt like my very soul was shaken and I couldn't stand on my own feet. What does it even mean? Why are you doing this? I let out with all my remaining strength. I took a deep breath and was able to pull myself up and stare this thing down. My child, you know not of what's to come. You must follow. I am your shepherd and you are my flock. Listen to your heart and hear my love and feel my intent. All of this is but a fleeting existence to the greater tomorrow. Child, even your family here are nothing but mere devices in a greater story. Screw you. I said as loud as I could push out my exhausted body. Child, I gave you what you wanted most, yet you still deny me. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It said, The sound of fluttering wings is all that I heard. Time returned normally. I turned to see my family and my brother and my father. Something was wrong. They were staring at me with massive grins, unhuman grins. Their smile kept growing and slowly, I could hear the squelching of their flesh tearing as their faces distorted. I reached out to them to try and stop whatever this was, but I was frozen, forced to watch. Red was pouring from their mouths and they were crying as they feebly reached out to me. I could see their arms outstretched, twitching, as they lost full the control of their own body. It was then that I heard the trumpets again, but this time, it was a distorted, as if played of key. It was then that my brother grabbed his bicep on his right arm, and dug his fingers into it. Red rushed out and sprayed on the floor, as he continued to dig. The sound of things snapping and sloughing off his arm was sickening. I watched in forced horror as my brother pulled his muscles out of his own arm and painted the room in a dark red hue. In a short time, I heard my father start to gurgle too. I reeled back to look at him, but I wish I never did. His body was melting as a dark black liquid started to extrude out of every possible opening on his head. The smell was awful, but yet pungent. I watched and that's all that I could do, as I saw my father slowly turn into a puddle, his very body melting in my own hands and his bones crumbling to dust. I was left alone again. Even the walls around the room started to decay. The darkness swallowed me once again. Shortly after, I felt it watching me. I swear that I can hear this thing that took my family a second time was weeping. After I turned to see it, it was crying tears of red. I felt nothing but anger as I yelled every curse word in the book and I ended my tirade with, I will never help you or your kind. I will let this world burn before I bow to a monster like you. 
Shortly after I woke up, I sprang out of bed and splashed water on my face. The horns, the sounds this thing were plaguing me with had stopped. A moment of short reprieve. These images of my family are still in my head. Why am I chosen to bear this burden, whatever it may be? Sometimes the good has wicked intent, I suppose. Recently, the town folk have been acting really strange and last night was even worse at this point, and I'm fearing that these things are going to take me too. It all started in the morning. It felt normal at first. I woke up, made coffee, and ate some eggs and a basket, just like my father used to make. I decided to turn on my radio tower and to start broadcasting my music as I normally would, when what seems like a woman started pounding on my window. Immediately, this made me spill my boiling hot coffee on my freshly pulled out of the dryer pants. I yelled in pain, oh, what the? Once I pulled myself together, I see this woman staring at me through my window. She was covered in blood. Her eyes were as white as marbles and she was smiling. Shortly after, she started banging on the window again, this time, and I got to see it. Her hands were missing, and it was just a stub with bits of flesh hanging on it. I dropped down behind my desk and I almost vomited. This lady was my neighbor, Mrs. Jacobson. Normally, she would come by and hand me the newspaper. She and I weren't friends more, just friendly neighbors, and just my mail would often end up at her place. I didn't know what to do as she continued to pound on the window, with each consecutive hit making a sickening noise as the stomp slapped on my window, leaving more and more red behind. I stayed behind my desk as the image of her unearthly smile was burned into my brain. It wasn't more than a few minutes when she stopped. It was then that I decided to slowly peek over the edge. I just saw her standing there staring at me. No, through me. I could feel her gaze pierce my soul. She slowly opened her mouth and it started to stretch an inhuman length as her mouth easily grew to be about one foot long. What do you want from me? I yelled. She just kept looking with her mouth wide open. It was at this moment that I went to the window and just shut the blinds. I could hear her yelling. Nothing that makes sense, it was more just random ghoulish howling, with a voice that was far too deep for her. I called the government guys in the church. Hey, you guys said I should call if anything is out of the ordinary. Well, right now, Mrs. Jacobson is outside my home banging on my window with a nub and screaming like she's possessed. I waited a few seconds and heard nothing. Hello? I asked annoyed. Eh, we've sent a team. Lock your doors and don't let anyone or anything in. I looked around and just said, Okay, can do. My office where I run the radio out of has very heavy oak doors. It was carved by my father and was made so thick and heavy that it blocked out sound from our house. My guess was so no ambient noise could bother his work. I rushed to my office doors and right before I can close it, I heard my front door burst open. It was her. She lifted her only hand pointed at me with her freakishly open mouth, and this time her eyes were completely white. She screamed an ungodly scream and started a full-on sprinting at me. Now my hallway was not very long, but I was able to slam the door shut and deadbolt the door. She started banging on my door again, and I could barely hear her screams. It felt like hours of her just nonstop pounding by my door and screaming. I was stopped abruptly when I heard faint people yelling for her to get on the ground, shortly after followed by shots. I then hear the men yelling with screams. The bullets they shot left small holes in my door, large enough for me to peek through. When I peered through one of the holes, I could see this crazy lady devouring these heavily armed men. The sounds that it made were awful. The twisting and grinding and crunching. I couldn't look away, but I was absolutely mortified by this beast of a woman that I thought she was. 
and I kept looking at her grotesque features and noticed her body was healing slowly, growing together. The color in her skin was coming back. She slowly turned her head all the way around like she was an owl. I could hear her spine cracking from the pressure. She could sense me watching her. We locked eyes and she stood up and slowly turned around, keeping her eyes locked on me. It was then that she sprinted at the door, scaring the crap out of me, and I fell backwards, as I could see her eyes now bright white peering through one of the holes. She then spoke, And thou shalt eat the fruit of thy own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee, in the siege and in the straightness, wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. She spoke in a loud and thunderous tone. It was so loud that it made me disoriented. I yelled back, What do you want from me? As my vision slowly came back to normal, she spoke again. Child, you are a key part. You will recognize your role soon enough. Right after, I saw a bright white light and heard the sound of trumpets blaring. It felt like the whole world was shaking. Items were falling off my shelf and my roof cracked as the lights got brighter and hotter. It all stopped and the light vanished. The residual heat was still there, but Mrs. Robinson, or the thing she was, was gone. I opened the door slowly. All I saw were the bodies of the men and ashes on the floor. My carpet was stained a dark crimson, and the smell of iron and burnt popcorn filled the air. I decided to shut my door and lock it again, and called the command center that was in the church. They asked what had happened, and I explained it all and told them, Come get these men off my floor, and I'm not leaving this room until it's safer. I will not be destroyed by some old lady. On the other end, all I hear is, Understood, you need to stay safe there and bunker down. I hung up and started leaving this note. Right now, they're cleaning the carpet and removing all the evidence. I overheard them saying that they found a slime of some of the bodies. I don't know what to do. Whatever happens next, I sure hope I can end these dang monsters. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. These words have been stuck in my head, playing on repeat like a broken record. I can feel my sanity fading as sleep deprivation sets in. I feel like there are eyes watching my every move, people narrating my every thought and feelings. I even stop playing music as more and more townsfolk go missing. It's only a handful that are left from the town originally. For the people who tried to help me, the holy water in the church is locked up for some reason, and I did sew some crosses on me. The pain of doing so wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. It's nothing compared to the mental anguish I've been dealing with. So thank you all for the kind words and suggestions. Recently, besides the constant scripture running in my head, and the occasional townsfolk hulking out and attacking more soldiers, it's been quiet. No one really leaves their home. I don't get calls about the radio, and everyone seems to be surviving off the government rations that they have been giving us. If anyone was wondering, it's pretty bland. Just boxes of potato flakes, off-brand water that tastes like pool water, and bread with some bologna that looks gray in color. Day in and day out, I feel like I'm not being protected but contained, like a prisoner. They even stopped answering my calls, which started this morning. However, some real stuff went down and I'm not sure if anyone other than me, and maybe some of the town is still alive. It was shortly after I got ignored when I tried to call into the HQ and report a body in the street. It wasn't more than five or ten minutes when I started hearing the horns again. This time, I learned the horns only played when someone was being targeted. I know this seems inhumane to say this, but I made test subjects out of my neighbors. Once I hear the horns, I go to all my windows and I look around, 
See what or who is being targeted and like clockwork, I hear it. Someone begins to scream. And then silence. After so many times that this has happened, I become numb to the cries of the people. I can't stop thinking. They are the lucky ones being taken out and not having to live with these things for much longer. I'm pulling away from the point so that after the horns this morning, I looked around all over town and saw nothing this time. I kept looking and it seems that they were all safe somehow. Shortly after, I heard gunfire coming from the church. They're being taken down. I started to hear someone calling out to me. A voice that was very familiar but I couldn't make it out. All of a sudden, my body moved on its own accord. It was helplessly moved toward the church. It's terrifying to think that you have no control over your own body, safety, or life. With this all left to the will of these angels. Last I checked, angels don't devour humans. At least it was never spoken about. As I started to pass the first gate, the smell of gunpowder and blood attacked my senses. It was so powerful that my eyes began to burn, and I could taste it in the back of my throat. My body slowly marched toward the front door. Bullets were still flying through the door. One struck me. The pain was unbearable, but it was only just the beginning. I could sense time slowing down, or maybe my senses were speeding up. The bullets that went through the door also had pierced my chest, my arms, and neck. Each bullet ripped into me, had me experiencing the pain for what felt like years, as time seemed to froze. I was feeling the projectiles tear into me, and I felt every inch give way to the metal. As much as I wanted to, I couldn't cry out in pain or run away. The tearing of my body had gotten so extreme I felt like I was going to expire any second. Have you ever felt your heart being pierced by hot lead? Or have the feeling of your chest cavity fill with liquid? This must be hell. I thought as my body slowly marched forward. The smoke in the church began to clear, and I saw the absolute chaos that had unfolded. Bodies were everywhere, and they were laying in ways that reminded me of a horror movie. People fused together in the floor, faces missing. One of them I stepped on, making a squelching noise as my foot peeled away a layer of them. No matter what I did or thought, I couldn't stop. My body felt like it was being controlled like a puppet on strings. When I got to the basement, the door was ripped off the hinges with the door itself pushed into the wall. Flashbacks as a child ran through my mind. I remember playing hide and seek in this basement with some of the other kids in the town, many of which I've seen eating other people in all this chaos. I remember my brother and I hiding behind a stack of chairs. We pressed ourselves as low to the ground as we could. We giggled as someone nearly found us. We only got up when we could hear the other boys yell, All right, we give up. Y'all can come out now. As we stood up, I saw a black dot on my brother's neck. Shortly after, he had yelled in pain and ran out. It was a black widow who had bit him. My brother was rushed to the hospital, which was almost an hour away. And I held his hand and kept telling him, It'll be okay. It was just a small spider. You'll be fine. Of course, my brother was milking the attention. Some of the best acting I have ever seen was from this moment. After a few hours in the hospital, he was discharged and ever since then, he had been afraid of spiders. This memory, even with all the pain and crazy stuff, made me smile. It was a relief that was short-lived as I approached the pastor's quarters. The lights in the hall were flickering and to the left and right of me, people were standing at the wall looking at me. All of them with jet black eyes and pale skin. The people of this town were just meat suits for these things. I've grown a hatred for them, parading around doing unholy things in people who I considered were friends and family. Even when I tried to think of memories that I had with them, the images of these things were replacing them, corrupting my very thoughts. As I passed all these people, I finally got to the door. It flew open by itself and I could hear the crunching of bone. 
it was my brother. He was eating the blind agent. I could only wait as he was in a trance-like state. I was forced to watch my little brother, or what was my little brother, eat the eyes of this person. After the thing was full, he stood up and turned toward me, looking in my eyes. His eyes were dark and it showed no light. It was all black and I could feel an overwhelming sense of malice as it just stared at me. My body was still unable to move as it slowly closed the distance. With each step, the feeling of dread grew and it felt like my heart was getting louder. I could only think to myself, is this what true fear feels like? Will I live for another moment? He got in front of me and said one thing. A war is coming, and you are a major piece in it. Will you stand by humanity or those winged beasts whom watch over and terrorize you? I cannot make the choice for you, child, but know this. I do love you. This oddly felt genuine, and the feelings of dread and malice were dissipating. I don't know how to describe it other than it felt natural. Child, I will not harm your brother as he agreed to help me speak to you. The angels above cast him aside like a broken toy. However, I found use in the boy, and together we can take over the heavens. Pray that we succeed, for I have seen the throne of God and it was empty. Who was he? What was he? Suddenly, this being reached down and tapped my forehead, sending me into a deep sleep. I woke up nearly instantly and was in a panic. Covered in sweat and I surveyed my surroundings. Everything was too quiet. So I rushed to look out the window toward the church and it was all normal again. I quickly called the operation leader and they instantly picked up. Yes, Alex, are you okay? How are they alive? I saw my brother eat him in front of my own two eyes. I replied in a rushed and worried tone. What day is it? How long have I been asleep? Well, it's Sunday, and I would say you've been silent for two days. I guess that old lady really stressed you out. How are you feeling? I could hear typing in the background as if he was typing down our conversation. I'm fine, just had a really bad dream. How many people in the town are left? I asked. Most of them are left. Why? Everything okay? At this point, I decided to look outside, and I saw people walking around and talking like nothing had happened. I'll be okay, thank you. It must have been just a vivid dream. And so I hung up, not wanting to speak about it anymore. I didn't want to go through it again. After, I fell backward onto my bed, breathing in deep and letting it out. The trumpets are not playing, and it was just silence. I'm still shaken up by this since it felt so real. So I'm going to start my radio up and pretend nothing happened. There's one question on my mind. Can my brother still be saved? I may never know. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 6.12 What is time? Is it just a construct of a man to keep with the pace of our existence, or is it something more malleable? I can shake the feeling that I've done this all before. The existential dread of this whole situation seems so familiar. Alright, sorry, you don't know who I am. My name is Alex and I live in this rather small farming city. We have a church on a hill and one very local grocery store and somehow there's a Dollar General too. Life here is rather simple and easy. I wake up, I turn on my studio, and I broadcast music for the town. It's nothing special, just a classic rock in some country, but I make decent money off of it. Recently, I've been experiencing stranger and stranger events, but it all feels like a dream. It all started when military trucks and other large equipment were being hauled into town. They took over the church as a base of operations, I'm guessing. They even put large fences and barbed wire all around it. Whatever they were doing had to be serious. They came to my door and asked to use the air raid siren. 
The only way to access it was to enter my shed and turn it on manually. When I told them this, they just said, That's fine. We'll just go into your backyard once a week and run a test, so don't mind us. I cocked my head a little, as I could have sworn that I had heard this before. Yeah, that's fine. Just knock on the door before you go back there, just in case. I'm in a stand-your-ground state, so I didn't want to catch a charge for taking out a trespasser. They just looked at me and smiled and said, We'll do, Chief. And then left and got into the truck and drove off. I looked around and across the street from me, and I could see my brother mowing his lawn. So I walked up to him wanting to speak. Hey, big bro. He stopped the engine of his mower. Hey, little dude, how have you been? How's the wife doing? He smiled and said, I'm great, but we have big news. I looked at him puzzled. Well, what is it? Sammy's pregnant. We just tested this morning, and I feel like since you've helped me so much in life, you can be the baby's official godparent and uncle, of course. I cracked a large smile ear to ear. Wow, I'm so happy for you guys. My brother then just put his arms around me, and we shared a hug. It was nice considering all that we've been through together. Why don't we have dinner here tonight? I'm grilling ribs and the wife is making potato salad. You know, it's your favorite. Hmm, that sounds perfect. I've been wanting some home-cooked meals. I've been swamped with work and school recently. He just said, Alright, I'll see you then, but I need to mow. It won't cut itself. I waved goodbye and walked back to my home so I could start the next playlist on the radio. When I get back home and when I open the door, a wave of emotion hits me like a ton of bricks. I started crying, but I don't know why. My heart is racing and I could feel anxiety rushing in. I tried composing myself enough to get to my bed, but I just laid there sobbing. Why am I sad? Why is this happening? I thought to myself. Shortly after, I get a knock on my door. It somehow pulled me out of the anxiety attack, which was good. I opened it, and a man with a look to be cataracts in his eyes greeted me. Hello, Mr. York. How are you? I looked at him a bit puzzled. Just call me Alex, and I'm doing fine. Can I help you? I felt a bit put off by this man. He looked to be blind, but he climbed up the stairs without aid, and he drove here. Oh yes, we need to use the siren and we want you to stay inside for a few hours. It's for your own safety. I started to panic a little bit but kept it under so he wouldn't notice. Sure thing, it's back in the shed. The man looked at me and just said, Thank you. Just lock your door and close your blinds. The siren will tell you the rest. I said, Well, aren't you going to be in danger too? He just started to walk away and yell out, I'll be fine, Alex. The anxiety was welling up my throat again, so in a hurry, I locked my door and closed my blinds. Shortly after, I heard the sirens go off. Stay inside and go to the nearest room without windows. If you can't, close the blinds and cover your eyes and ears. This is not a drill. Do not leave for any reason. If someone is caught leaving, they will be marked as a threat. If you hear knocks at the window or door, do not answer it even if it's family or friends, and even if they're in a dire situation. Again, this is not a drill, and we will let you know when to come back out. It's highly specific. I hope my brother will be okay. I waited there in my office, and I heard a song on the radio playing, and it was one of my favorites. Time is on my side by the Rolling Stones. It reminded me of my father a lot. Him and mom used to sing this song to us. The Rolling Stones were his favorite band. But all this daydreaming was cut short as I heard a shot across the street. I peek through my blinds and I see my brother. He was being attacked. This thing that looked like our friend Aaron but with grotesque and elongated limbs with a massive jaw. My instincts told me to hide but I couldn't. I couldn't let my brother get hurt. So I ran out and I sprinted toward his home. I needed to catch my breath, but I could see his front door ripped off its hinges. 
I was about to look inside, being cautious. Maybe I can catch this thing off guard, I thought to myself. So I peered into his home. It was the worst thing that I could imagine. A fine mist of red lingered in the air. I can taste it in the back of my throat. I almost gagged when I looked further in. It was Sammy. This thing was devouring Sammy. It sat hunched over her body, just feasting. I blacked out. After a while, I quickly regain consciousness, and I see the figure stand up with no sign of my brother or his wife. No blood on the floor, just a pile of black ash. The thing turned to me, but as we locked eyes, it started to distort my vision. Every time I tried to focus on it, it would disappear. But I look slightly away and in my peripherals. It looked to have changed its shape. A mass of wings, seven, no eight of them, circling something in the middle of it all. It slowly glided to me and I was frozen in place, unable to move or react. My chest felt like it was going to explode. And then it spoke. Its voice sounded like a rusty can being scraped by a fork with the faint sound of horns in the distance. Its thunderous voice shook my very existence as it spoke and it said, Be not afraid, child. You will be saved as you are a saint. I keep thinking back to where I've heard this and I can't remember. Was it a dream? In that moment, the mass of wings slowly moved toward me. In that moment, everything went black. I saw things I couldn't make out darting across the void in my mind. I had a scream in my ear and what got louder was the sound of a trumpet. Six blasts from a trumpet. No, it was seven. The thunderous voice spoke in my dreamscape. We will meet again, child. A war is coming. I woke slowly but in the distance. I could hear the flapping of wings and the siren go off once more. Civilians, the coast is clear. I repeat, the coast is clear. We ask you to stay in your home so we can do some more research. Please bear with us a little longer, thank you. Within mere seconds, I was surrounded by men armed to the teeth. Holy crap, he's alive! One of them picked me up and three other men rushed into my brother's home. What happened to my brother? I was still barely able to stand on my own. My head was still spinning. He's gone, I'm sorry. I gained a bit more consciousness and realized what he just said. What do you mean, gone? I was fuming. Something had just eaten my brother and his wife. We can't explain right now. We'll just go home and rest and we'll send someone to speak to you. I reluctantly walked back. But what can I do? Fight the armed men who were just trying to help me. It wasn't their fault. I clambered back into my home and went straight to my bed and I collapsed. I can't put my finger on it, but I sense a deja vu. It's all too familiar and I can't shake this feeling. As I laid on my bed, I relive in the thoughts of my brother and dying and seeing his wife being devoured. This whole thing seems so surreal. It wasn't but an hour later when I heard knocking at my door. I got up to answer it and to my surprise, it was the same blind man. Hello, Mr. York. I need to speak with you. I waved him in and sat at the kitchen table. Can I get you anything to drink? Um, what's your name? He smiled. My name is Lucy and yes, do you have a Coke? I blinked a few times. All right, Lucy, coming right off. I brought two cans of Coke, slid him his across my table. So, what was that thing and what do you want from me? He takes a deep sip of his drink and lets out a sigh. Oh, Alex, we know who you are and what you are. Haven't you felt like you've done this all before? It's time to give up on resisting, Alex. We need you. I looked at him puzzled and asked, what do you mean? He stood up and placed his glasses on the table. His eyes were pitch black. Light didn't even shine in them. It was all empty, like an endless void. 
I, uh, what's wrong with your eyes? He chuckled lightly. Oh, don't worry, child. Join my cause and we shall return your brother. I started to sweat. My heart was racing fast in my mind. Who and what is this man? It was then that he reached out and grabbed my hand. I was unable to move as I saw the future. Life and death, the start of the universe and the decay of it all flooded my mind. I felt I was everywhere at the same time. He suddenly let go and all the vision stopped. Do you understand now, child? We were destined to take over the heavens. You were meant for greater things. I, I can't believe it so, I asked. This is all too much right now. Can we do this later? He shook his head. You have until midnight or all of this will come full circle. I looked at him and he let out a long sigh. Fine, I need to do something first. He just got up and walked out of the door. It looked like he understood. So, here I am now. I know it's a lot to unpack, but I can't shake this feeling of deja vu.